Good evening and welcome. I'm calling the February 18th City Council meeting to order. Uh, and Council Member Walsh will not be joining this is, this evening. She has an excused absence. Um, for those that would like to join the Council and I for the Pledge of Allegiance, please stand. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda this evening is audience comments, and this is your time to address the council. Uh, the guidelines for public participation are displayed on the screen behind me. Please limit your comments to five minutes, and those who signed up on the sign up list will be called up first. If you did not sign up, I will still ask for other speakers when we get through the sign up list. And if you're here as part of a group, please identify the group that you're representing. As you're in the audience this evening, if you hear comments from a speaker that you strongly support, please raise your hand so council understands which issues you are here for and which issues you feel strongly about. Uh, Tisha, has anyone signed up to speak this evening? Yes, the Reverend Catherine Sed Sedwick. Thank you. I'm the Reverend Catherine Sedwick. I'm the uh, Episcopal priest, the rector of St. Michael and All Angels church here in Issaquah. I also live here, I'm at 275 East Sunset Way, so I'm just like two blocks away here. Um, and the issue about affordable housing and the project before you is extremely important, not just to me as a resident, but also to me as someone who's part of, I guess we'd call it a business, the church, that affects so many people. Hang on, here we go. Uh, it's entirely possible that none of you, maybe none of us in this room, would qualify for affordable housing. But then you can't really tell by looking at people, can you? How many months of no income would it take for you to need to qualify, for you to need to have that? It's a kind of scary thing when you start adding it up. I know a market rate profit on a property such as the one under consideration might normally preclude affordable housing, but I wonder, would we say that about any other ethnic, religious, cultural group? Is there any, how do we dare say we support diversity in our citizens, in our area, if we mean it for every group but this, for everyone is it just for people who can afford to be here with our market rate? We all know cities, neighborhoods that are all one income are not as healthy as the ones with a diversity. It makes a huge difference to the nature of the community. I know this is a complex project. I know it is not without huge problems and details, consequences, costs, but what one is? None of them are without that. And stepping up here is well within our civic identity. It's in, within our ability to do it. And you've clearly got the brain power to make this work or we wouldn't even be talking about it. There is a possibility here and we have a chance to take it, to make a big difference. Affordable housing isn't just about the cost of housing. It's about how much you have to do just to survive. Do any of you want to try getting home to Maple Valley on a bus when you work at Issaquah Coffee or in a restaurant on Front Street? When your kid is sick, when they say, come get them? It means you can't participate in sports for your kid. You can't help with homework. You're not there for all of those school functions. How many of us want to forego that kind of thing in our lives and in our families? Are we better off or safer? without insisting on affordable housing here? Or dealing with an increase in encampments with homeless folks because we just don't care enough to make it work, to have it? What if the one needing it was you? Thanks. Thank you, Catherine. Tisha, next on the list. Mike Prillwitz. Thanks. Hello. 
Uh, my name is Mike Prowitz. I live at 650 First Avenue Northeast here in Issaquah, Washington. I'm the manager of uh, Issaquah Village RV Park. Um, the reason I'm here today is because there's there, there are th some things that are coming down that we need to address. And uh, quite honestly, I just want everybody to know both sides of the story. So I'll tell you right now, um, there's more to our park than it's not. It's it, it's 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 not a trailer park, okay? It's a community. It's a residence for 56 uh, different people, housing over 100 people, maybe more. Um, we have 28 spots that are pretty much permanent. And there are 26 to 28 that are uh, monthly spots that people have lived there for many many years. Um, a lot of the the spots that are just available for weekly or monthly or short term are, are available for not just people traveling and recreation type of incidents. It's it's more we have a number of traveling nurses. In fact, I think right now we have seven or eight traveling nurses that um, reside in our park. Um, we have numerous cancer treatment people that are, they, they come through the park all the time because they live in eastern Washington where there's not the, the wonderful facilities we have here in this area. Um, so it, my, my job is kind of sad because I see um, this kind of stuff every day. Um, we do have the recreational person that comes through, of course. It, it's an RV park, and, and it's, I think it's something that is um, done good for the community because not only do we house these people, but they spend money in our community, um, pay taxes, work, and <laughs> everything all of us here in this room probably do. Um, I understand the need for 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 the the, the low income housing. I, I totally get it. I'm a, a person that cares for people, but I also understand that we're basically doing this in a way right now, as uh, uh, just with what we're doing. So, as far as I, I I'm, 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 it's it's hard for me to do this because I live there. My wife lives there. Um, we we run the place. We there's many people that will be literally looking for a place to live that have lived there for many many years. A sad note this morning, coincidentally, um, one of our oldest, longest tenured uh, customers passed away this morning. Um, we knew he was going to. He was going through some, some really bad stuff. <laughs> but anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're a community. And take that in consideration when you're deciding what you want to do. Um, I, 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 that's, I guess that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for coming and talking. I'm sure it's very difficult when you have one of your neighbors pass away. Sorry. Is there anyone else on the list? Yes, Heather Finnerty. Heather? I'm back. <laughs> Thank you for um, having me again and um, allowing me to speak. Um, I'm hoping that um, being able to get through um, kind of the last few slides of a, the presentation that we started last time um, we were here, we'll be able to kind of take a little bit of a break as we um, work um, with coordinating kind of what you've been able to help put together with the city planning um, and working on uh, tackling the issue. Um, and so I'll try to talk as quickly as I can so that we can get through this. Again, I live at 423 Southeast Clark Street, um, just in the Old Town neighborhood. And um, where we left off last time was casting this net, which is about a half mile perimeter around um, Old Town Issaquah, which kind of is where Willie and I wanted to focus a lot of our attention when we were talking about school zones and safety, pedestrian safety, um, because we figured we could cast, cast the widest net possible and get the most help that um, we could get in one foul swoop, trying to enlist the help of uh, the school district and um, you as well. Um, 
in the meantime, since the last time I've seen you, I did uh, briefly visit the school board and um, just let them know that I was there and we were working on this and um, that eventually we hope to be a part of their agenda um, at some point in time. We have not um, actually um, figured out how to do that yet. But <laughs> we were pointed in that direction, if we can go to the next slide. Um, and so I wanted to kind of just walk you through what we have, because what, what our feelings are, and just looking at that, we realized after um, working with city and the plans for the city as well, um, is that the school zone is going to, could cover all of Old Town and help make improvements, but it doesn't cover everything um, that would ensure our pedestrian safety. And so what we're hoping for on that side of the coin um, of school zones is that our kids are provided for the same as Cougar Ridge kids that are going to school. And it's a protection of 600 kids roughly, and we've got over 4,500 kids that we feel that we need to provide the same accommodations for. And so this is just a listing of what they have surrounding their school that we would expect to surround our schools um, with three times the population, four times the population. Um, and so we're looking at four-way stops at key intersections, and I understand that Second and Bush may not, as far as city planning goes for a four-way stop, may not be feasible um, for traffic flow. Um, after hearing information, um, I, I hear that the data is showing that the problem that's trying to be solved is traffic flow, whereas our, our problem that we're trying to solve is pedestrian safety. And while they are related and may intersect, they are not the same problem. Um, and so I, I really want to make sure that we are looking at them separately and not confusing one for the other. Um, and so while Second and Bush might not be feasible to have a four-way stop, how do we provide that same safety of a four-way stop for the people who need to use that intersection? Um, and what was proposed is a good idea to start with, but we have some ideas to maybe try, try to make it a little bit, a little bit more pedestrian friendly rather than more car friendly, travel friendly. Um, but we are also wanting lighted crosswalks and I was told um, before I left that if the four houses on that corner had agreed to it that perhaps we could have that lighted push button crosswalk there and um, I'm in the process of um, making sure and confirming with those four houses for you that that is what, what they want. It's my understanding that they do, but I want a face to face, yes, they would like that before we continue as well. Um, but that, the 6th Avenue and Bush Street um, interchange right there was not addressed in the city planning, and so that concerns us still as well. Again, if we had a half mile radius of clear double-sided school zonage with flashing um, lights and speed zone trackers, multiple traffic um, camera locations, speed limits painted directly on the roadways, which in between the time that um, we last spoke to, I realized that the city of um, Seattle um, changed their speed limit zoning in 2016 so that all non-arterial roads are 20 miles an hour and arterial roads are 25 miles an hour. So that's another factor that could, fact, that could come into play here and kind of change, change the game. If we made our neighborhood 20 miles an hour and paint it directly on the roadway, just as it is in Cougar Ridge neighborhoods, um, that could solve a lot of the budgetary needs as well. Um, but looking at raised crosswalks, uh, the proposal was one raised crosswalk, and we're wondering, instead of a four-way stop, could we have two raised crosswalks in addition to the lighting instead? Um, because one raised crosswalk, kind of, I think that you pointed out that maybe if we did a four-way stop last time, that it's not going to solve the traffic on Bush Street necessarily. And if we have one raised crosswalk, it unfortunately, I think, is going to cause more traffic on Bush Street as it's going to slow everything down from Andrews over because people are going to have to go slower over that speed bump opening up Bush Street to that left-hand turn. Um, so we want to consider that as well. Okay, it's okay. Um, I just think that people... Timer? Do you want to take a few, uh, quickly summarize anything else that hasn't been said? If we could go to the Thanks. next next page. I think that people, rise, just an old teacher trick, people rise to the expectations that they're given. Um, using that neighborhood as a cut through um, isn't legal whether there's signs posted or not. We need law enforcement to support us because no matter what the changes are within the city, if it's not supported by law enforcement, it's not gonna matter. So if we can, if we can get everyone on board to help us, um, it would be great. There is a particular uh, road in Edmonds that is really difficult to go down. I'm sure you've been down to the water and it, um, cars want to go down it and the police uh, force, law enforcement officers have trained people not to go down um, at 40 miles an hour. Everyone knows that on that road you go at 25 miles an hour. The same thing with other cities. We need some retraining on how to use that 
non-arterial roads and we need help from everyone not just city planning not just the school district but from law enforcement as well thank you Heather. thank you anyone else signed up on this evening and some hands up in the back yes elizabeth maupin <clears throat> Hello, my name is Elizabeth Maupin. Um, I live in Issaquah at 100 Big Bear Place Northwest, and I coordinate the Issaquah Sammamish Interfaith Coalition. Um, I spent a portion of today on the third floor of the King County Courthouse, where they told me that they had more people there facing eviction seeking redress than on any other day they can recall. It's been building, rents keep going up, and people are getting pushed out. Um, as far as the RV park here, I was really concerned about the transit-oriented development when it seemed like it be, might be pushing people out from there, but I have been assured that the city has arranged so that the the property that would be given to CenturyLink would not impact the RV residents, that there would still be room for all of the people who are there. For that, I'm thankful. Um, the transit-oriented development project came into being as a small step to redress the city's negligence in allowing so much high-end development without securing housing for our low-income residents, our school bus drivers, our shop clerks, and many others on whose labor we all depend, and also families with disabled children, where the family members need to be home and spend time with the kids more than the rest of us. They can't hold full-time jobs and do that, but they're still important parts of our community. So the affordable housing was part of the central Issaquah plan that wasn't getting actualized, and that's why we had our uh, affordable, where we had our uh, housing permit moratorium a while back. And this development uh, was thought of as a way to redress things. The development along Newport Way that everybody's so upset about was already in the pipeline with no affordable units. If we put some housing near transit, it can reduce the need for owning a car. And poor people have more trouble keeping cars running or owning cars than the affluent citizens. And it would also reduce the need for the use of personal vehicles, a response to the, our citizens who complain. They don't want any development because it would increase traffic. The proposed development includes both market rate and subsidized units. This allows people to get to know the neighbors who have different resources and connections as Catherine spoke about. This kind of networking is really helpful if you isolate poor people in ghettos, it hurts them, and it keeps the affluent neighbors from understanding what it's like for us to live with few resources. Economic apartheid allows false fears of the other to flourish. Mixed income neighborhoods like this one would benefit our whole community. The research also shows that providing housing is less costly than caring for people who have no shelter, and housing people near locations where they work and shop greatly reduces traffic. So I am here to say, please don't let all the work that's gone into planning a transit-oriented development that includes affordable housing and market rate housing, go down the drain. We need this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Is there anyone else signed up this evening, Tisha? No. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council this evening? I'd actually like to respond to that if I can. There's 
20 seconds. Do you know what uh, I saw you get upset when you heard a comment you didn't agree with? And we will be having a brief presentation this okay. evening, and I will make sure that I'm looking over at Jen, who's ever doing the presentation, will clarify how much of the park remains and how much of the park would not. Okay, uh, Mr. Kapler, are you walking towards the microphone? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, David Kapler, 255 Southeast Andrews Street. I think you got my email addressing um, my concerns about uh, disruption of the uh, efficiency of the uh, Public Works Operation Department. If there's any department over decades that has performed unbelievably well through um, floods and snows, it's that department. Um, I think um, taking their next logical place for expansion being the level area right immediately adjoining their existing uh, yard would be um, a, a cause great um, inefficiency in the department, which will end up being reflected in our water rates, our sewer rates, our stormwater rates, and getting to addition uh, issues with, with roads. Um, I'm also concerned about the parks department and uh, where we'd go with the um, phase three and the um, existing parks and building maintenance um, area now um, next to um, Confluence Park that um, would ideally be relocated. And um, when you see the storm damage that happened to that um, western part of that property, you realize that um, the creek is constrained through that corridor. Perhaps giving a little bit more room would, um, would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, David. Anyone else wishing to address the council this evening? Come on up. Hello, uh, my name is Loretta Jankoski. I'm a member of the Human Services Commission. And I really just wanted to say that we had maybe the best discussion we've ever had as a commission because of the questions that you gave us at the, the uh, recent study session. So we wanted you to know that the result of that careful way that you looked at what we proposed was extremely helpful and I think caused us to understand much better what we were asking and why we were doing it. So we just wanted you to know that and say thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Is there anyone else who would like to address the council this evening? Come on up, Steve. Hello, good members of the council. Steve Pereira, living in Old Town about 12 years now. Uh, so I wanted to speak on two things briefly. Uh, when I sent you some comments or input on, that's the parks proposal, and I don't want to talk about, again, specific details. Please refer to the email, but just overall, as we look at budget cuts going forward, I think we're not focusing on the natural beauty and sustainability and, and recreation, more on fixed structures. I think we, as we look at future costs, we need to look at maybe kind of curtailing or scaling back the things that we think we want and think we say we're gonna pay for, that people really don't wanna pay for, but want for free. Uh, so I'm looking at this body to kind of constrain those wants that people seem to wanna to have to be more in line to preserve the things that we really do want. Uh, so that was my piece on parks. On the TOD project, I want to get to yes very badly. Uh, I think this is a good project, it has some opportunity in it, but I don't know that I'm there yet. Some questions that I would still like to see, to see answered are, one is, is there any way to revise the number of housing units that are reserved for the income level to be more for a lower level income? I think, I forget that there's some initials that go with that, I forget what they are. Uh, I don't want to subsidize people that make 65 or 75 or $95,000 a year. That's not where we need it. A second question is, um, does this squad have the right to say we want to reserve X number of these units for teachers, for firefighters, for policemen, or is it just strictly a first come, first serve uh, basis? Uh, a third issue is, I know that at least as I understand it, there's $1.5 million specifically earmarked from uh, affordable housing that was not built in the Talus build out. I would like to see if there's a way or ask if there's a way of going forward to making sure that future development m completes the affordable housing unit they've committed to and not simply write a check. I'd like to, as part of that, I'd also like to better understand uh, where the difference between that $1.5 million that's being earmarked and the rest of the money, 
I'd also, there's some associated or related costs beyond that, I think $6 million figure that I've heard that would be required to make this work. I haven't heard things like additional road work, additional maintenance, parking be addressed other than what's the, other than using the uh, park and ride lot to afford that. I think my other concern related to that is if we don't have enough existing parking in the place, people are gonna build at the new Tibbetts Park that we're talking about building and utilizing that. We're not having enough requirement for parking in this place uh, to make that work. So while I wanna get to yes and I'm not a no, I don't think there's been enough feedback and discussion to warrant moving forward yet at this point until those questions are better answered. Uh, again, I want to get to yes, but I'm not there. I so much admire those that have championed the cause for this. I'd like to see move forward, but there's still unanswered questions that I think need some more discussion and solidity and less of a risk commitment from the city. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And there were some hands of support while you were talking. Thanks. Is there anyone else who would like to address council this evening? Second call and a third and final call for anyone who would like to address council this evening. Thanks, we'll close audience comments. Uh, we had quite a few speakers this evening talking about pass-through traffic in Old Town. Lots of speakers talking about either the RV park, the transit-oriented development proposal, the public works ops and parks maintenance yard, all related parts of the same project. And um, it's always appreciated when commissioners come and give feedback to the council. Thank you for doing that. We love closing the feedback loop. And also about some parks planning this evening. So thank you all for taking the time to come and talk to council. Moving off of audience comments, the next will be committee and regional reports and we'll start with council member Hall. Uh, thank you, Mayor Polly. Uh, no report this evening. Thank you, council member DeMichelle. Um, I, re I uh, attended on February 5th the first uh, Healthier Here board meeting that I was assigned to. Um, so I'm going to start, and I promise I won't do this every time, but just explain what Healthier Here is. Um, it's a new board that was formed in 2017 to oversee the state's five-year Medicaid transformation funding in King County. So what is Medicaid transformation? <laughs> so I had to do some, some reading to figure out what this board actually did. It's an agreement signed between uh, Washington State and the federal government which allows us to test new and innovative approaches to providing health coverage and care. And these approaches are breaking down the barriers or the silos between physical and behavioral health and between medical professionals and social workers so that healthcare resources can be used more effectively. So there are nine of these regional boards in the state of Washington and Healthier Here is the board, which is also called an accountable community of health for King County. It's responsible for dispersing our share of the $1.5 billion that have been allocated to the state of Washington for this Medicaid transformation. Um, there are now 29 members of the Healthier Here Board and um, we are there because we're, we're representing the Sound Cities mm -hmm. Association, which holds one of those seats. So at my very first meeting, they voted to disperse $48 million in funding to King County, so that was kind of exciting. <laughs> and um, Issaquah is actually receiving some of that funding through the Eastside Fire and Rescue, uh, the new uh, partnership with the Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank for the mobile, mobile, health van, mobile health van. So we are in fact receiving part of that money and I hope to find out more about what part of that we will, we will be involved with. So our representative, um, I am the alternate to Healthier Here. The uh, representative is Samra Riddle from uh, Lake Forest uh, Park. And she asked a very good question and that was the geographical distribution of these funds and is that gonna be equitable? Um, that inquiry was put into the form of a motion and the answer is yes, there will be a geographical equity study done and that will be posted to the Healthier Here um, website. So I think that's always a question for suburban cities. Are we receiving as much as Seattle is? 
I also want to acknowledge that the co-chair of Healthier Here Board is Esther Lucero, who is an Issaquah resident. So I'm hoping to meet with Esther soon so that we can discuss this in more depth. And I'll also be participating in an orientation with the uh, executive director of Healthier Here next week. Um, the other business that was before the board is we received a report from Patty Hayes, the director of Seattle King County Public Health on the coronavirus epidemic. And of course those numbers are changing every day so that report is already out of date. Uh, but I would like to let people know that the Seattle King County Public Health website has daily updates on the coronavirus epidemic. So that's my report. Thank you, Councilmember D. Michelle. Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Mayor Polly. The Eastside Fire and Rescue Board of Directors met on February 13th, and Councilmember Ray and I attended as the city's representatives on that board. Uh, the board held its annual elections for leadership, and Alan Gottel from North Bend was elected chair again. I don't know how many years that is, but it's <laughs> many. I'm not sure any of us are ever gonna get to be chair. <laughs> um, I'm just teasing, he's a good chair. And Council Member Ray was elected vice chair uh, for the second year. The, we heard that there was a fire recently at Station 88, which is at Wilderness Rim in North Bend. Station 88 is a volunteer or reserve station. The fire started in an aid car, which um, the aid car was a total loss. Uh, there was damage to the apparatus bay and also the living quarters. Uh, there is insurance coverage. Repairs are going on now. The reserve firefighters have been moved temporarily to Station 76. Uh, the speculation is that the fire was caused by a problem with a vehicle that's being investigated. It is the only vehicle of that make and model in Eastside Fire's fleet, so there's no concern of a similar fire occurring in another vehicle. Eastside Fire is also working to roll out a wildfire, prepared, wildfire preparedness plans this year. Um, that preparedness will include reducing wildfire risks around homes by reducing or eliminated what are called home ignition issues, such as highly flammable items around um, a home's perimeter. Um, the, one of the programs is called FireWise, and there's a link to that program on the Eastside Fire's website. Eastside Fire also is working on a wildfire preparedness plan um, that um, includes um, items such as evacuation, and um, Department of Natural Resources wants to partner with Eastside Fire on that. The Board of Directors will have a retreat on February 27th from 4 to 8 p.m. at the Hilton Garden Inn. As all of the meetings are, this one is public. On the agenda is a review of the, an overview of the department, director roles and responsibilities, budget overview, strategic plan, which uh, they're gonna do an update um, this year, and board development. Fireground 101 is planned for May 26th at the Bellevue Training Facility, and this is really a fantastic opportunity for elected officials to learn about the inside workings of the department. And I would encourage um, my fellow council members, if you haven't in the past, to attend, because it's really, really great, um, a great event. I don't know that it's an event, but you attend and learn a lot. It's, it's very, very interesting. The uh, Finance and Administrative Committee meets February 26th at noon at the headquarters station on Newport Way. The only item on that agenda is continued discussion of the proposed new governance model, which would change Eastside Fire and Rescue to a nonprofit. And that topic will come to this body for review and comment and ultimately for approval, so stay tuned. And that's my report. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Councilmember Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The Puget Sound Regional Council's Growth Management Policy Board met on Thursday, February 6th, and uh, we had a, we covered a number of items. We recommended a conditional certification of Black Diamond's comprehensive plan. We had a presentation on a housing incentives and tools survey, uh, which was taken with all of the uh, PSRCs members and I'm, I'm talking with staff about how, city staff, about how we might take that information back and um, sort of uh, use it to take a look at how that survey compares to um, what we've enacted over the last uh, several years, both with the moratorium and with our strategic plan. Um, it could be an interesting uh, comparison. Uh, there was a discussion item on the state, um, there's a state legislative update. Um, and then there was just um, informational item on um, supplemental biennial, biennial budget and work program. Uh, then the Sound Cities Association Public Issues Committee uh, met on uh, February 12th, and we had a lively discussion of the legislative session, specifically around House Bill 2907. 
the punchline is that House Bill 2907, which um, people have probably heard of, um, it is a tax on businesses with over 50 employees that have employees that make more than $150,000 a year, uh, with the proceeds intended to go for affordable housing. There was much, much, much discussion. I, uh, I don't think I've seen an item uh, in front of the PIC that has had that level of discussion ever before. We probably had 45 minutes on it. But the punchline is I don't have anything to bring back to council because it's a moving target. And um, so uh, what I will say is that a number of the issues that were uh, brought up, including um, local uh, authority to tax, including uh, regional equity, uh, are I think that the, the folks debating it in Olympia are well aware of the city concerns in, in or the municipality concerns in these areas. Um, but it's a really tough topic. I mean, some of the sponsors of the legislation are from South King County, which is where some of the cities that have are, that have the most vehement concerns that are sort of leading the charge to be careful and measure twice and cut once on this bill um, are, you know, live and are, are in our municipals. So it's a, it's a big complicated topic um, and uh, I just, there's nothing that, uh, SCA PIC is set up, for those of you who are new, um, that um, typically what we do is on major issues we have one action meeting and then I come back to council and I get feedback from uh, everybody here, and then I take that back to PIC, and then um, the PIC cities make a, a recommendation to the uh, PIC, to the SCA board on whether to support or not. I mean, this this thing is moving so fast that there is not, you know, anything I would tell you today may be different in 48 hours. Um, so with that, I would just encourage. I know the city is is well aware of. Uh, of this and other legislation that we have in front of us in Olympia, uh, and to just stay aware of this um, and the discussions that are going on around it. Uh, there was also another lively um, discussion around uh, regional transit policy and plan updates. Uh, there is talk of a uh, county uh, uh, levy going in front of the voters, potentially still here in 2020. Um, instead of a Seattle, this, this is also a moving target. Um, I've, I, I've sort of reported back to the administration about this, but this is another one that there isn't a specific uh, piece of legislation in front of the county yet that is in a form that we could, that SCA, you know, could even conceive of taking a position on, much less that I could come back and ask my fellow council members about. But this is also a moving, you know, the, the chess pieces are moving on the board. Um, and I, I do uh, appreciate council member D. Michelle uh, forwarding some information uh, around how that Metro Connects is currently thinking about transit um, on the east side. Um, I think that you know, at the heart of it for us, of course, is the long-term com long commitment from Sound Transit to provide mass transit out to Issaquah, but, you know, there's so much beyond that um, that we want to see. And in our retreat, we talked about transportation, and, and, I, and I talked about that in, um, at, SC, at PIC about some of, the, some of the regional issues that are important um, in East King County. Um, but there just, there isn't a firm fixed target upon which um, we, could, we could discuss the, the pros and cons right at this moment because it is evolving quickly. So I apologize. It's, it's in a sense, a slight, it was slightly frustrating uh, that we, we can't sort of do the normal uh, way to weigh in on conversations, but I would just, again, encourage my fellow council members um, to follow this and um, discuss with the administration um, as the administration, uh, you know, uh, talks. Uh, we're lucky enough to have our own mayor on the board of SCA, so we have a good voice at the table um, as, uh, as these events unfurl. So um, thank you for indulging my long-winded report. Thank you, Council Member Mertz. Deputy Council President Ray. The King County Growth Management Planning Council, not to be confused with the Growth Management Policy Board, uh, will meet on February 26th from 4 to 6 uh, p.m. in the Puget Sound Regional Council Boardroom at 1011 Western Avenue. The agenda has not yet been set, and that concludes my report this evening. Thank you. Council President Hunt. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On February 13th, the ad hoc for the Title 18 um, code overhaul met with staff. So this is the group that is working on our land use code. 
and we discussed um, several substantive areas where we are looking to um, influence with this code update. So we're currently going through the process of isolating substantive issues um, and thinking through how we might go about a public engagement process to get uh, engagement on different areas of interest such as tree preservation and terrain management, the standards having to do with development on hillsides. And those are two of the examples, but we're going through the process of how we might organize those into um, workshops and into a meaningful public engagement process. Um, we also reviewed several issue papers that were um, prepared by staff and um, we will be coming to a study session soon with more information for the full council on the progress of the ad hoc, so please stay tuned for that. That concludes my report. Thank you, Council President Hunt. For the mayor's report this evening, there will be an executive session this evening to discuss pending and potential litigation per RCW 42.30.110 per N1 per NI. And these items are expected to last 50 minutes. No action is anticipated. I thought I would get a cringe out of that. No action is anticipated in open session. For my two other news items this evening, they are weather events and emergency response. And both have been covered by the media, but I felt like it might be appropriate to provide a little bit more comprehensive detail on both of those here. So a report out on the February 5th flooding event. Heavy rains occurred in and around the city of Issaquah and the Hobart area focusing flooding on the main stem of the Issaquah Creek. Almost six inches of rainfall was measured upstream of Issaquah near State Route 18, resulting in downstream flows of almost 2,700 cubic feet per second. 15 homes, including some apartments, were damaged in the flood. Typical damage included flooded crawl spaces and damage to heating ducts. Several homes had water inside the living space. In addition to city crews, citizen emergency responders, our neighbors and friends, volunteered their time over several shifts to fill sandbags, load vehicles, shovel mud from driveways and garages. Volunteers logged over 400 hours of service during this event. There were no reports of injuries that we have been made aware of. Red Cross responded and coordinated with Issaquah Human Services on assistance to individuals, and to date, only one Issaquah resident accessed a Red Cross shelter. For commercial properties, we were informed of, of one uh, item, which was bank erosion near the Issaquah School District Administration site. In our neighborhoods and around town, residents noted debris on roadways and silt in stormwater system, ad systems adjacent to creeks. Sediment traps and Newport Bridge Bypass Channel, both filled with sediment. A slide on New Northwest Newport Way, east of the Transit Center that closed the road. And a slide reactivation in the 700 block of Mountainside Drive Southwest. The city response expenditures to date are approximately $80,000. The total cost estimate for cleanup and follow-up is estimated at approximately $250,000, but it could be higher depending on costs associated with slide mitigation. Many roads were closed due to flooding or other activities, and that included Southwest Newport Way was closed due to flooding, Northwest Newport Way was closed due to a slide, Southeast Sycamore Drive was closed due to flooding, Hobart Road closed due to flooding and debris flows, State Route 900 closed due to flooding and debris, and all roads are now back open. An extended closure of Newport Way Northwest occurred as city and county assessed the slide that had occurred on the slope, bringing trees and debris down into the road. As this work is being completed, Jersey barriers have been placed at the toe of the slide to facilitate safe passage of vehicles through the slide zone. After these measures were complete, the road was reopened to traffic at 2.20 p.m. on February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day. The speed limits in this area were lowered to 20 miles per hour through the slide zone to assure caution when pass passing through this impacted area, and city staff is continuing to monitor the earth movement and work has begun to evaluate long-term stabilization of the site. Many in our community track the storm and flooding through social media with high activity during the storm on all different platforms that we're putting information out on. The other incident happened this weekend uh, in the Montreux neighborhood. And over the weekend, our police department responded to a suspicious circumstance call in the Montreux neighborhood that was soon found out to be a hostage situation. As the incident evolved, the crime scene also included a response to a large house fire. All hostages were rescued, while the suspect who barricaded himself in the house is believed to have died in the fire. This is a horrible tragedy for our community, and our thoughts go out to the family that is affected. Also the neighborhood. 
Washington State Patrol is assisting with investigating the overall incident in partnership with King County Fire Arson Investigation Unit. And I am extremely thankful for the work of all of our first responders, including the significant number of partner agencies that came to our assistance this weekend. And those were the two items for the mayor's report. Next item on the agenda is informational updates. And the first item is, I, and only item, is ID 0526. Anchor Parks Master Planning Update, and Jeff Watling, our Director of Parks and Community Services, is here to start the presentation. All right, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. I will, uh, I'll kick this off. We're, uh, we're certainly excited to provide you uh, with an update on this work, um, as this work has really reached a, a, a transition point uh, in that uh, we are um, wrapping up, we've wrapped up phase one of public, enga uh, of public engagement. Uh, that um, engagement work has really informed the work that you'll see tonight. Um, we wanted to share this with you prior to um, sending this out and launching phase two of public engagement uh, with the community on, on what you're gonna see tonight. So our adopted park strategic plan in 2018 really shapes and has been shaping our priorities, not only for our parks, but also our trails and our open space areas. Um, some key points that we heard through this uh, process and through the adoption of this plan was um, our co community was really committed to ensuring that we're taking care of what we have. We're taking care of our existing public spaces. Um, as best we can, we're modernizing them, we're making sure that these current parks are able to support uh, the needs of Issaquah residents today. Um, that really lend, uh, the strategic plan really lent uh, to the work and the focus that um, is in the project that you're gonna hear about today, and that's uh, really around three, what we see as the foundational parks to Issaquah's system. Uh, Veterans Memorial Park, uh, which is behind City Hall that really supports Old Town. I'm pointing to it now for those looking at it, uh, watching at home. Um, pardon me, have it. Um, Tibbetts Valley Park, uh, which really is a foundational park um, in that part of town and will really help support um, as Central Issaquah begins to take shape. Um, and then lastly, uh, what we're calling the Issaquah Creek Corridor, which really is um, a connection and, and better connecting uh, to the creek, but also connecting uh, decades of investments that this community has made uh, from our southern border at Squawk Valley Park all the way up um, through Lake Sammamish State Park to uh, the lake itself. Uh, the goal of this work is really to be forward thinking um, as we endeavor into this planning effort. This is not something we're planning on constructing next year. Um, as we've engaged with the community, this is really about setting a vision and allowing the community and this discussion and feedback with the community to shape uh, what the vision is that we wanna be. Um, taking this long view will allow us um, to, um, as future investments come into these three um, anchor parks, these foundational parks, uh, those investments will um, move us towards the vision, move us towards the goal that we um, have created and that we have in mind. Um, it'll allow us to be proactive in that way. Phase one of engagement uh, started last July. Um, through that engagement, we had hundreds of very enthusiastic responses from uh, the community. Um, a lot of that feedback echoed what we heard in the park plan and, and really that echo is, let's reinvest in what we have and let's better connect uh, what we have. Uh, the engagement effort, uh, I won't go into all these dates, but uh, really, um, allowed us to speak not only to the community but many of our partners. Uh, we have many partners and many interest groups that um, our parks support um, and that they support our parks. Uh, we'll continue to reach out and work with these uh, groups um, and partners um, into this next phase of work. Uh, what you're going to hear tonight and what you're gonna see tonight with these three parks, uh, park areas are concepts. Um, I'll invite up Deb Gunther from Methune, um, our, our consultant architect team to, to walk through these. Um, just to, to highlight though, these are not designs. These aren't intended to be designs. Like I said, that um, we're ready to construct next year. Uh, we're really intending uh, these concepts to help um, explore opportunities, to explore the likes and dislikes uh, that the community has with these really, really important public spaces. Um, 
and it'll be work. Uh, the feedback we're gonna hear is really gonna help us um, inform a preferred concept that very likely will be a blend um, of the concepts. We'll borrow ideas from each of these concepts you'll see tonight, and in some cases, maybe even uh, be reinvented ideas from uh, the engagement. So with that, um, Deb Gunther. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, um, Council, for um, the opportunity to share this with you. We're really excited about um, what we've been hearing from the community. And um, there are, as Jeff mentioned, there are three different Anchor Park um, ideas coming out of the strategic plan. So I'm gonna go through some of this information fairly quickly, but feel free to, in the Q&A to come back and I can touch on any of this so uh, in a little more detail. Um, so Tibbetts Valley Park up on Newport Way and again near the central Esquad growth area, um, you know, a regional sports facility and opportunities here. What we heard from people were um, there's a creek here. There, Tibbetts Creek is, is, runs through this park. So not a lot of connection to the creek and people really wanting that connection to the creek. Uh, people really walking loops um, in this park and obviously coming here for the uh, terrific sports um, facilities. Um, again, these three ideas that I'm sharing are, as, as Jeff mentioned, are kind of bookended ideas to just talk about the conversation around um, what are some of the improvements that could happen and what could make these spaces really used um, in multiple benefits in multiple ways and really serve a, the, the broad growth that's happening in Issaquah and connect to that central Issaquah growth area to the north on this plan. So this plan um, looks at a transition zone of a lot of active uses along Newport Way as a way to bring people across the street and um, move into the park and, and keep those activities uh, making Newport Way a little bit more pedestrian, or sorry, a little bit more um, community feeling. Um, and then these are just some of the precedent images of, of what some of those spaces might be when you start connecting to the creek. For example, some amphitheaters, um, ideas about renovating the existing uh, manor and, and, and whether that uh, wants to be in that location. So every scheme sort of explores that in a different way. Uh, and then this is the view along Newport. The second idea is what if those sports fields um, were actually divided with that those activity zones that were along Newport Way in the previous scheme, but this one is going right through the, the sports field. So kind of bringing activity right into the center. Um, you actually see this in a lot of athletic field complexes that it kind of brings a lot of um, the, the activity and enthusiasm of the sports fields into these spaces, but also makes them active when, uh, when league play isn't happening. Um, and this is a view through, you can see kind of ball fields on both sides and the, the spine through the middle that would connect the, um, the intersection um, at Newport Way all the way across to the neighborhood where the dog park is planned on the hillside. And then the third option was really looking at the creek. So if we were really making um, the most of the visibility of that creek, how could that creek be visible from that main intersection as you're driving into Issaquah at Newport Way and then um, really bringing people down to the creek. And um, this, this scheme also is the closest scheme to the sports fields that are there today. So the thought is on all of these schemes is that if you go with turf fields, um, synthetic turf fields, you can get more play out of the out of the field. So as growth occurs, you might consider in this scheme four instead of five um, baseball fields as one consider consideration. Um, and but you'd get more play out of it because you're able to schedule more frequent um, games given the uh, the the you know, drier fields. Um, one of the other differences in these three schemes is parking. Um, so the other two schemes had parking on both sides pretty much where it is now. This scheme looks at what if it was consolidated, what if it was stacked, um, and um, you know, would you be then able to get more creek presence on that, the opposite um, corner at the intersection. So just all of these are, again, our ideas to discuss and just trying to bookend um, uh, the conversation about what what's important um, and what we're hearing from a lot of community members is the that presence of the creek is important to them. 
So the second um, anchor park, you know, right here behind the building um, or across the street is uh, Veterans Memorial Field. So really um, the opportunity to have a destination uh, park for the community right in the downtown. Um, and what we've heard time and time again from the community members is um, that unless they're coming here for uh, a game, they're not actually coming here that often. Um, and so it's a little bit of a hidden gem. Um, they may, maybe they're coming here for salmon days, but um, not, not, not a lot of um, uh, connection. Um, a lot of people wanting a lot more use um, around the senior center. And then a lot of folks um, interested in more play for uh, children's play, loving the, the play equipment that's there and really thinking, wow, it would be great to have that be even more um, a larger play area. So this range of options looks at um, uh, different f scales and adjacencies of program that essentially is a, pl a water play area, um, uh, some some of the expansion of the activities around the senior center, and then and play areas. And so, uh, we also heard a lot about folks really in liking the idea of being in a garden experience, and um, and the idea that multi-use a multi-use uh, open grassy area is really important. Um, so all three of these schemes um, do not have a formal uh, baseball field, um, but the idea is that more use will be happening in Tibbetts, so it can kind of pick up the league play that happens at this park. Um, but the field was still important to people. It's also important as a, as the Veterans Memorial, um, uh, as a, a honoring the uh, veterans in the uh, community. So this scheme, um, really looks at the history of, of veterans, or history of Issaquah by picking up on the rail lines. Um, the, also people love the depot park and how could that be expanded. Um, there's a lot, been a lot of collaboration with Don Fells who's working with the arts um, and culture about how art can be fully integrated into these plans and this plan in particular has a lot of opportunity for arts integration with that history. And I think one of the things that this, these plans are also hoping to do is to continue the conversation around what kind of stories want to be told through the design of these parks, what kind of stories are important to the community to commemorate through the art and through the way that these parks are designed. Um, this plan is uh, the idea of a valley meadow. Folks talked a lot about living up in the mountains and then coming down into the valley. And so how could this park actually express the valley more clearly? And so um, in this scenario, it's about um, a super bloom loop. So a valley meadow that might have a really wonderful botanic qualities and um, you know play a wonderful place, wonderful smells, wonderful seasonal change. Um, and then a little bit larger um, splash play area, and then uh, we're also looking in these schemes at different ways that parking might uh, might be adapted um, and over time and in conjunction with how parking works in the city overall. So um, if, if there was a desire to look at um, you know, how, how the parking could become a courtyard, could become more of a plaza. So maybe during festival times, it's, it's a shared street. Um, but on the a average day, it's parking like it is today. But on a weekend, it might be um, parking more remotely and having more space for people to come and use the park for special events. So the idea of the super bloom, again, the botanic garden experience, um, and what that might look like. This is a view from, uh, you can see the train depot on the left and the city hall would be on the right, looking into the park. And then the third idea is the, the foothills. So um, thinking about more of a landform idea and how that could be the experience that people are um, having moving through the park and, uh, and maybe having a continuous splash play uh, it, environment that could even be an ice skating rink, an ice skating path even that in the winter time. So many of these splash play environments could change into ice skating in the winter time. So we heard a lot about people interested in seasonal use um, and being able to come out here maybe enjoying um, a fire pit or enjoying warming huts in the winter time.
so what some of that might, uh, those uh, environments might look like, and that same view into the park with more of a foothills approach. And then lastly, in the creek corridor um, idea, um, this is a really interesting, we, you know, Issaquah has the Rainier Trail, but one of the things that came out of that park strategic plan was the idea of um, how the multiple ways that you could connect from Lake Sammamish Park all the way down to Squawk um, Park, so Squawk Valley Park. So there, I think the, the, uh, the thought here is that we heard a lot from the community about how important habitat was, so they were um, acknowledging that um, the wildlife corridor that that represents is as important as the pedestrian and biking corridor, and so there was a lot of interest in expanding on habitat environments along that spine that would connect from the, the state park to Squawk um, Valley Park. And, um, and then the idea that there might be multiple ways that you could get from uh, through that uh, through that spine, and then also that people were really impressed when they looked at the map and they saw how much green space exists in Issaquah and really uh, not really aware. They might have the park that they go to on a regular basis, but not really aware that there's another park nearby. And just the connectivity that loops would provide um, that to connect those existing park spaces was very exciting to people. And uh, the idea that, uh, you know, they people were very focused, of course, on the loop that they could experience near their home, but then the idea that they could connect to another loop and have a different experience would really expand um, the opportunities for people uh, to use the parks in many different ways and get to a different kind of, uh, of, of facility in another part of town. So what you're seeing here, I, I'm gonna share three um, segments and, uh, of the Creek Corridor idea. Um, the pink represents the spine, so that's actually a, would be a four mile uh, trail that would connect all the way from the state park you see here down to, to the Squawk. And then um, the yellow is the loop trail that happens within each of these reaches. So this is the northernmost around Pickering Barn, and that's the, the we're, you're seeing the Pickering loop there, and the dark green is the Pickering Barn in the center. Um, and then thinking about that crossing at I-90, um, and then uh, uh, this the character of this area is much more kind of open valley, uh, valley meadow, um, and uh, uh, some really great you know habitat opportunities here with I-90. So some of the images that are, will show up on the survey that folks can kind of weigh in on um, uh, have to do with how to engage the creek, how do you want to view nature, how to, what kind of trail experience would you want, and how would art be integrated um, into, this, into this experience. So then moving into Old Town, it becomes a little bit more of an urban creek experience, um, and you can see the connectivity, the loop around Confluence Park, and then the loop around downtown. Uh, and these are some of those images, what those might feel like. And then the Squawk Valley Reach, which is much more wooded, much more um, uh, lowland and mountainous um, kind of combined. Um, a lot of great habitat opportunities and a lot of opportunities to um, really uh, do some connectivity that uh, picks up on a lot more topography down in that um, southern reach and a lot more forested area. Um, so very different places along that four mile experience and that's one of the beauties I think of, of the idea of the emerald, um, or sorry, of the green necklace uh, that you can have a lot of different experiences, a lot of multiple benefits that come out of the park system. So I'm gonna turn it over to, to Jennifer to share next steps. Thank you. Good, Good evening, next Jennifer steps, And then we'll go to questions. Okay, go ahead. Uh, good evening, Jennifer Fink. I'm just gonna quickly run through um, what our next steps are for this project. And um, as Deb said, we're gonna be updating our park board next Monday night um, regarding a, much of the information that was in your packet this evening. And we're also gonna be preparing many of these graphics for an online survey. 
Um, it's really gonna be three large surveys that go out to the community, really asking their questions about experiences, um, some multiple choice questions as well as open-ended. We're really wanting to see what's resonating with the community. We're gonna take all of that as part of our phase two engagement and wrap it up and uh, create a proposed design from that feedback. Some of those designs may not look like anything like the concepts that were shown tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier, those are just launching points for discussion. Uh, we'll take the community feedback that's created and come up with a proposed design and then we'll take that out as part of our phase three engagement uh, for some more open house and some workshops and online. Now, up to date, all of these um, master planning efforts of all the public engagement has been done simultaneously. These are now gonna start after this next uh, survey that's going out soon. Uh, we'll start breaking apart from each other and we'll go down their own individual paths towards master plan adoption. Um, during that time, we will be updating Park Board and coming back to you periodically. Uh, we'll be revising our schedule once we get the community sur surveys back seeing where we're at within each park's natural process towards master plan completion. And that's our goal towards the end of this year to have master plans for each of these parks. These master plans will inform our future um, capital requests, grant opportunities, and help inform what our future vision for the community is. So, um, we'll also be um, as part of the master planning process, developing an implementation plan, which how would we successfully phase and what costs might be for each of those phases so we can um, successfully implement the master plans that we're coming up with. And of course, we'll be uh, updating council along the way and coming to you for final master plan adoption down the road. So with that, um, I just wanna say a quick thank you to Mathun as well as Don Fells for their efforts and expertise to date and like to open it up to uh, council for any questions you have of Jeff and Deb and I. Thank you, Jen. Questions? It's just an informational presentation tonight. There's no action required. Council Member Hall. Thank you very much. I might have um, more questions, but one that just came to mind was just kind of um, logistical. So is phase two for community engagement just the survey? There's um, no more open houses or anything like that. It's just the online survey, is that correct? Yeah, we've done extensive community right. outreach up to date. Yeah. So we've packaged that up into these designs here. And so this survey will just be uh, online, but the mm -hmm. next phase will really get into a lot deeper uh, realm. And we'll also be talking with Park Board on Monday as well. Thank you. Other questions? Council President Hunt. Thank you. I wondered if cost is going to be part of the next phase of discussion because I think that people can give more um, useful insights when they have a sense of how much different elements of these different plans are costing. And I didn't see any cost info today. Yeah, it's a great, great question. I, I think where we're at now with these concepts are still very programmatic and very, um, um, a high enough elevation that we're really talking shapes and not necessarily design concepts. There will not be a lot of in-depth cost estimates with this next phase that would go out in the survey. I think as we um, get community feedback and start moving towards that um, third phase of engagement when we're um, getting a little bit more specific in terms of um, uh, not just program ideas but um, actual um, elements uh, will be much um, at a much better place to start doing cost estimating and getting feedback, community feedback based on relative cost. Additional questions. Uh, Deputy Council President Ray, then Council Member Michelle. What does it mean to adopt the Master Parks Plan? To adopt each of these plans? Well, you said but, one of the things we will do in the future is to adopt the master park plan. What does that mean? I mean, what, is, what does that signify? What are we adopting? So the way uh, Title 18 is written right now, these would be master site plans that would each be individually adopted um, um, as they came before you. So as, as Jennifer Fink said, um, these projects will now start to become individualized. Mm -hmm. So Tibbetts Valley Park would be adopted at a, as a master plan, uh, just as 
uh, Veterans Memorial Park uh, and the Creek Corridor would be. Is your question, are you adopting a graphic? Uh, my my question is what are we committing to when we adopt a master park plan? And or if we adopt a site plan, which is Tibbetts Valley, what did we just commit to when we did that? That's my question. So when you adopt, again, as Title 18 is written right now, as you adopt a, a master plan, you are um, um, agreeing to a vision or an overall concept of what you want that park to be. There is no financial commitment that comes with adopting a master plan. It uh, merely uh, becomes the guiding tool, the guiding instrument for uh, what capital investments we would be making into those, um, into those public spaces. And then how do I tie together that with the, the implementation that Jennifer spoke to? So within that master plan, we will um, have um, implementation strategies, realizing that um, a park of that size or scale is likely not going to be built all in one phase. So um, it would give suggestions on how we might implement um, um, that plan in a phased um, approach. Thanks. And Councilmember Member Michelle? Uh, I think I'm looking more for just clarification. You touched on uh, with the memorial field that uh, there would be possibly a displacement of that sports field. And um, I've talked to uh, parents whose kids are involved in Little League and they're very concerned and there's a lot of pressure in our community to have those sports fields available for all of those activities. So just clarification about how you're planning to work through that with those groups and um, what that might mean for um, the people in our community who are very invested in sports. Yeah, great question and, and one we're very um, committed to as well. In fact, just last Wednesday night, we met with uh, baseball representatives from multiple baseball groups, Little League, Issaquah Baseball Club, and a number of other uh, groups talking specifically about that very thing. How do we, as we're looking at the community interest in diversifying some of these park spaces, um, that have been quite baseball centric mm -hmm. over the decades. How do we make sure we diversify these spaces to be what the community wants, but also um, uh, make sure we're accommodating current and future needs for baseball and softball. And so um, <clears throat> what you'll likely see as we're working with the community on these, on these parks um, is um, what does existing use look like? Uh, the field uh, there at Veterans Memorial Field um, is not utilized all that much anymore because of its size and location. Uh, there's still there's five um, infields at Tibbetts Valley Park. Uh, they're never all used at the same time, right? So how do we use our scheduling data and understand how they're currently used, what the current need is, uh, and make sure we're uh, meeting that and working very much with that, um, that user group. Thank you. Yeah. Additional questions? Uh, Councilmember Martz. Uh, Boulder. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 before I think about uh, proving anything, I uh, want to see Boulder, uh, as in more bold. Um, <laughs> uh, Tibbetts Valley Park, uh, love the idea of expanding what's capable there. Um, the elephant in the room is the manor and what to do about it, want to see if, if it has to exist, if we decide not to bulldoze it, what could it be that would support the park, um, that would be in line with the park. Go creative with that. I don't know what that looks like. Um, uh, Veterans, Veterans Memorial Field, that baseball field is totally underutilized. I know this because I can always fly my drone over there. Uh, <laughs> when I want to have some place to fly, it's always wide open. Uh, as space to fly out of, which I appreciate, um, but I love the idea of water features. I don't know how often it's cold enough for long enough to ice skate, but I'm from Minnesota, and I have wonderful memories of uh, skating on Como Lake, but this is not Minnesota, so I don't, I don't know how that works. My biggest concern is both the potential and the challenges around the reach that you've defined 
uh, for the creek. Love it, love it, love the idea. I have a concern about between Confluence and Sycamore, it kind of loses its way. The northern end is gorgeous and makes sense. The southern end is gorgeous and makes sense. You've got those other loops that occur throughout the middle. Again, go bold. What could we do? Could we even go over to the base of Tiger and then come back? I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. Um, but uh, that stretch of it I look at and, you know, just going down Issaquah Hobart Road by the side of the road does not feel like uh, what we want to do with this beautiful space at the center. So I'm, I'm excited um, by these views. Um, this is in, in 10 years, sort of the first swing for the fences kind of look at, at um, the parks in the valley. but. But swing again for the fences, and again, and uh, I think there's a huge appetite in the community to see the transformation of these spaces. Thank you. That's a very wonderful thing to hear. Um, I think a lot of the things you're describing are things that we've been talking about, and um, so we want to um, continue to hear, you know, from folks and kind of. Uh, I think that's super helpful to 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 take another look, and um, especially, I think the idea of. Look, looking at Tiger Mountain, looking at sort of the, the sort of how you go further out is a critical part of just moving people around town and it all, you know, holds on to the quality of life when people can move around town a little easier. So um, I think those are great suggestions. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Council President Hunt. Two comments. One, I think that public engagement on this is very important. These are parks that are going to be serving the community, and so the community should have a really big role in the f determining the future of the parks, and that is why I raise the cost information question, because I think the more information you can provide people about the trade-offs involved with the different options that are on the table, I think they can give us more supportive and more helpful feedback and also be more informed. So um, I would encourage you to continue to take that into consideration as you do your um, public engagement. And then um, also, I think it is great that we're talking more about how we can um, have people enjoy the creek and um, interact with the creek. I know that Tibbetts, for example, it is quite um, hidden. It's not very clear where the city, you know, if you're supposed to be there. Um, and so I think that that's a really great opportunity. At the same time, I think while we're, while we're uh, facilitating people getting to the creek, we need to be that much more careful of protecting its ecological function and protecting the habitat, because we don't want to destroy the thing that we're looking to, to have people enjoy, you know. So, um, I, I see those words, habitat, and I just wanted to really stress that while I think it's great to um, bring people closer into that habitat and enjoy it, we also then have to be that much more diligent about protecting it. Thank you. I could just add briefly that we have a wonderful ecologist in Herrera Environmental Group, and so um, they know a lot about the creek already, and um, so we've done a creek walk with them, and they've really been critical in identifying those key habitat areas that we'd want to not be bringing people closer to. The... Thank you. Any other questions on this informational item? Thank you. Thank you, team. We'll be moving next to the consent calendar, which was distributed to the council in advance. And if authorized, the items on the consent calendar will be considered together and approved by one motion. Have the payables and the payroll been reviewed? Yes. yes. Thank you. Does any council member desire to remove any item from the consent calendar and consider it under regular business? Okay, seeing none, is there a motion? Uh, council President Hunt. Move to adopt the consent calendar as listed in tonight's published agenda. Second. Um, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That passes unanimously. We're now in the regular business portion of our meeting, and the first item is AB 7780, Cemetery Management Agreement. This item was before council on January 28th at the council study session. And I'd like to ask Deputy Parks Director Brian Bernston to come to the lectern and begin the presentation. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mayor. 
Once again, I'm Brian Bernson, uh, your Deputy Parks, Recreation, Parks and Community Services. I'm sorry, Director. Community Services. Yes, I'll give you a quick cliff noted version, catch you up on sort of where we're at right now, and then move into staff recommendation for what we're asking tonight. <clears throat> This agenda bill is going to seek uh, council's authorization, authorization to enter into a cemetery management agreement with, uh, for the Hillside uh, Cemetery, which is upper and lower, with Flint Offs Funeral mm -hmm. Home. Um, Flint Offs is a Issaquah-based business with expertise in funeral, cremation, and burial services. Um, reviewing the operations and the partnership with Flint Offs was part of our uh, planning effort for the city-owned Hillside Cemetery that kicked off at the beginning of uh, 20, on part of our 2019 work plan. So throughout 2019, the city, Flint Offs, and the cemetery board discussed and developed the cemetery management agreement. The city and Flint Offs agreed to, roll to the roles and responsibilities delineated within the cemetery management agreement. At the October 1st, 2019 cemetery board meeting, the cemetery board uh, moved to recommend that the mayor and city council approve and sign the cemetery management ag agreement as written. This motion was passed unanimously. On uh, January 28th, during the council study session, staff presented uh, the cemetery management agreement with Flint House Funeral Home and requested council's input prior to tonight's council meeting. Uh, the following changes to the agreement were requested. It was asked to replace parks and recreation with parks and community services within the document to reflect the department's name change, to use a gender neutral option for his designee, and to correct the RCW reference to RCW 68.52. Those changes have been made within that document. Additionally, a couple of questions were asked. Whether or not Flint Offs provides equal benefits for domestic partners, in response, yes, Flint Offs does provide equal benefits for domestic partners. Uh, whether a clause should be added to the management agreement in the event that Flint Offs Funeral Home is sold and or purchased by another entity within or outside the city of Issaquah. In response, the city attorney has confirmed that the current language in the agreement provides that if Flint Offs were to sell the funeral home to another separate entity, the agreement would be automatically terminate unless the city approved of the assignment. <clears throat> At the end of the study session, council expressed general support for the core provisions within the cemetery management agreement. So tonight, administration is recomm recommends authorizing the mayor to enter into and execute the cemetery management agreement with Flint House Funeral Home to delineate the roles and responsibilities of each party in the management of the Hillside Cemetery. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Any questions this evening? Well, we've seen it a few times, so I'm not surprised. Is anybody uh, willing to make a motion? President Hunt. I move to authorize the mayor to enter into and execute the cemetery management agreement with Flintoft's funeral home to delineate the roles and responsibilities of each party in the management of the Hillside Cemetery. Second. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 As opposed, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you. The next item on the agenda this evening under regular business is AB 7924, the 2021-2022 Human Services Grant Funding Approach. And the request before council this evening is for approval. This item was before the council at the January 28th council study session. And we have Human Services Coordinator, Monica Negrila, to give the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Polly, and good evening, council members. Um, tonight, I'm joined in the audience by representatives of the Human Services Commission. Thank you so much for being here, uh, including uh, the chair of the commission, uh, Mr. Derek Franklin, who will um, join me a little bit later to provide a few comments at the end of my presentation. Tonight, we are um, returning to council uh, to seek approval uh, to proceed with the recommended funding approach for the 2021-2022 Human Services Grant Cycle. And we are also seeking council approval to proceed with utilizing the designated allocation towards outreach services for individuals experiencing homelessness in our community. 
Um, a little bit of background. At the study session um, from January 28th of 2020, um, the administration proposed a funding approach for the 2021-2022 Human Services Grant Cycle that included two pilot projects to complement the existing traditional human services uh, grants. But specifically, we were proposing uh, to add, um, allocate about 10 to 12 percent from the um, current human services grants towards uh, designated services, um, in particular um, outreach for um, individuals experiencing homelessness. And we were also proposing uh, allocating 2 to 4 percent towards a grass, grassroots pilot uh, grant. Um, the majority of the funds will continue and would continue to um, be um, allocated through the traditional human services um, grants. At that meeting, Council um, expressed support for the um, funding strategy and um, recommended that we return to Council with additional information regarding the identified use for designated services. So therefore, um, the focus of my presentation tonight will be to answer those questions that arose during that meeting. Uh, just to, as a brief recap, um, the three funding um, approaches that were proposed um, um, are included here in the table. The green area includes the traditional human services funds, uh, followed by the contracts for designated services, um, and then the grassroots grants. Um, although my presentation will focus on the contracts for designated services, I do want to make a quick note um, because during the study session, a question was um, brought up regarding uh, possible um, staffing capacity uh, with managing multiple um, grassroots grants. And a suggestion in the Human Services Commission meeting was made to perhaps limit the number of organizations that we would support through this pilot project to a maximum of four organizations and also limit and max um, the amount of dollars that we would allocate to the initially proposed $20,000. Uh, so this will, um, this would um, allocate enough dollars for, or enough um, staffing capacity and support to um, help those organizations. So now moving back to um, providing um, answers um, from the questions raised during the council study session about the designated services. Um, I would like to um, provide information regarding the criteria that we used to identify these services, uh, including reasons why we chose to go with uh, this proposal. Um, we will also provide additional information regarding the impact of homelessness in Issaquah, uh, intersection with other local services, and we will also address a few outcome measures that we would like to propose for this project. Um, a few notes regarding the designated services, um, and I would like to start with a couple of clarifying items. Um, first of all, um, designated services is a term uh, that in the previous meeting we referred to as targeted services. In the meantime, we tried to change uh, the wording just to uh, provide for additional clarification. Um, however, um, uh, we wanted to note that um, we identified this service because um, we noted um, a need and um, a limitation with the current funded services for outreach services. Um, through the 2019-2020 Human Services Funds, uh, we allocate uh, approximately $26,000 uh, towards three different organizations that um, partially fund four um, staff that work with individuals who are homeless in the East King County region. Um, however, due to the large geographical area that the staff need to cover, um, in our area um, they do not have the capacity to come very often and provide meaningful um, time allocated. Um, and therefore, as you can see on the table, um, um, 
approximately outreach services in Issaquah are offered for about three to four hours per month. And our intent with this project would be to increase um, that time to 30 to 40 hours per week. Uh, in a nutshell and summary, um, basically by doubling our investment, um, we would uh, receive 10 times um, the um, amount of services and time um, in, in Issaquah. Um, another um, topic that I would like to approach is that uh, we would like to look at um, outreach for um, homeless services as a broader concept and um, we believe that um, this service is a conduit to other services um, and specifically um, through the human services through the current human services grants, about 47% of the allocated funds go to, uh, towards uh, funding uh, services um, for shelters, day centers, um, supporting housing services, uh, foods, um, and um, meal programs. And uh, these services are currently not accessible, easily accessible to um, our um, homeless individuals uh, due to the limitations of outreach and engagement services. Um, so therefore, we hope that through uh, an investment into the local outreach services, um, we could provide access to the services that we already provide. Uh, in addition to uh, the funds um, through the um, uh, for the um, housing and shelter services, as well as emergency funds. We also provide funding for education and job skills programs, as well as um, behavioral health services that we would also like to increase access to th uh, through the uh, outreach services. A few words about the community impact. Um, currently, um, uh, the library, um, the senior center, the community center, and our parks um, are constantly approached by individuals who are seeking a place to rest, perhaps some um, um, meals, um, showers, um, a place to store their, their belongings, and the staff at these centers are not uh, adequately uh, prepared and they don't have the capacity to respond to the needs. Um, and so um, in return, first responders and police officers are responding to social service needs instead of medical needs and uh, true criminal acts. Um, and so during this process uh, where we engage with uh, community and we ask for feedback, also we uh, worked closely with our police department who is also supportive of bringing local services, outreach services to Issaquah. Um, and um, in your report, you have additional information about um, the um, amount of money that the city spends on uh, cleaning camps and uh, the amount of debris that is available um, in the area. And lastly, I would like to add a few words about the intersection with other initiatives. Um, we've been in communications with staff from the Issaquah School District and with staff uh, from Eastside Fire Rescue as well as staff from Issaquah uh, Food and Clothing Bank. Um, and while we believe that um, there is intersection between the services that we propose and the existing services, our intent is to ensure that we do not duplicate services, uh, but that we collaborate and um, um, we enrich each other's programs. Um, for example, the Issaquah School District, through the um, McKinney-Vento Act, students are eligible for um, services, students who are experiencing homelessness are eligible for services such as reduced or free meals. Uh, they are also eligible for transportation or academic support. However, these services are limited to the students who are enrolled or in the process of being enrolled and do not extend to family members. Um, also, um, so there is a, a natural connection there where we can supplement each other's programs. Um, as far as the Eastside Fire Rescue, the mobile integrated team, um, 
the, the current uh, project that is in collaboration with the Issaquah Food and Clothing Bank um, reaches out to um, frequent 911 callers, uh, and these are um, typically residents who are isolated and who do not have the support in place uh, that they need. Typically, they are not um, individuals who are homeless. It is rare that um, homeless individuals call 911. It is those individuals who are um, perhaps um, sometimes um, seniors with no families who have um, medical needs and social service needs that um, would be mostly um, served through the Eastside Fire Rescue um, project. However, again, there are possibilities for us to collaborate and um, we have uh, planned collaborations underway. And with that, um, these are some of the proposed outcome measures that we would like um, to propose for the outreach services. On one end, we would focus on both quantitative and qualitative measures, um, but um, in addition to focusing on the effort and outputs, uh, we would also like to um, track um, outcomes. Uh, in particular, in addition to having more hours available in Issaquah and in addition to having a staff who's embedded in the community, closely working with um, police officers, Eastside Fire Rescue, Library Community S uh, Center, and the court senior center, we would also like to track um, the results that come out from those engagement services, in particular, not only how many people were reached, but how many people of those who were reached were engaged in services, whether that's treatment services or other connecting services that they might need. And of course, also the ultimate goal is to also track um, how many people are connected with shelters and housing services as well. Um, and with that, our recommendation tonight would be on one end to proceed with the recommended funding strategy that includes the three uh, funding options proposed, and then to also proceed with the allocation of designated funds towards outreach services. Um, if council supports our pro um, proposed um, strategy, uh, we would pursue with um, releasing the RFPs for all three projects in March, followed by the Human Services Commission uh, reviewing uh, the applications received between April and September, when we would return to council with initial recommendations. And we will also continue the conversation with council and come back again in October, November, during budget deliberations and adoptions. And with that, before I am um, available for questions, I would like to invite um, um, the chair of the Human Services Commission, Derek Franklin, to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Monica, um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, and Derek Franklin is my privilege to serve as chair for your Human Services Commission. I have a few prepared comments tonight um, I'd like to share in regards to Monica's presentation. Uh, on behalf of the Commission. Um, as you're aware, the purpose of the Human Services Commission is to study emerging issues and concerns in the human services area to ensure that the basic survival needs of Issaquah res residents are met and the support systems are in place to help people through economic and personal crises. Um, through this process, the Commission has identified it as a priority to address the homelessness crisis locally here in Issaquah. Uh, of course, homelessness is also at crisis levels regionally. Our determination takes into account the broader context in which solutions to homelessness are being discussed, including constructs such as income inequality, poverty, mental health and addiction, um, equitable tax structures, social justice, availability of low-income housing, economic opportunity, institutionalized racism, and more. And clearly, these are big issues. Um, while it remains critical to discuss uh, these issues, at the same time, uh, meaningful solutions to this issue can still be found at the local level. Um, when cities help make the experience of homeless, uh, homelessness for its residents rare, brief, and one time, they help both the lives of those individuals and families and at the same time contribute upstream to regional solutions. The issue of homelessness is complex and due uh, to stigmas or lack of visible services locally in Issaquah, it can also sometimes remain hidden. Uh, the Commission recognizes that struggling families nearest the edge are most visible to those nearest them and part of their community. 
rather than to program and service institutions that can be somewhat removed from their daily lives. A dedicated outreach worker for the city of Issaquah can embed themselves in local micro communities and do a better job, we think, of creating linkages and supports that both prevent and intervene in the processes that contribute to homelessness. Um, in terms of human uh, the Human Services Commission funding recommendations to council, we have historically suggested investments in a wide range of services, both locally and regionally, that create human services or human services portfolio for the city that maximizes the impact of available funds. This remains a solid approach. Uh, however, uh, to enhance and improve this philosophy moving forward, we support the adoption of a refocused homelessness outreach project that will fill some identified gaps and strengthen linkages uh, to important services, some of which are concurrently funded by the city. Uh, with a similar focus on localizing funding to maximize impact, we also support the proposed project to allow a small percentage of dedicated funds to be packaged with individualized support from city staff to support small local human service startups. These grassroots efforts harness the initiative of local residents and provide great opportunity for targeted outcomes while supporting the spirit of community innovation and engagement. Um, thank you for your continued support for human services and for the residents of Issaquah. Thank you, Dare. Thank you, Monica. Questions? Council Member Hall. Um, thank you very much for a very in-depth presentation and for answering all of our questions from the last study site. I spoke to embedding um, a vision of embedding these services where they're needed most uh, in uh, community facilities like the library and the senior center and the community center and our parks. Um, I would also add that it might be beneficial to um, uh, canvas local businesses, especially in the Old Town area. I've, um, my mom works for Village Theater and she tells me all the time people experiencing homelessness coming in looking for a place to use the restroom and to lie on a, a bench for a while. So uh, ensuring that our businesses know um, who they can get in contact with so that way they can get the, service that the services that they need. Um, um, because I'm sure many businesses wouldn't really know what to do, or maybe they would just call emergency services right away, so. Totally, thank you so much, yeah. very helpful. Comments or questions? Councilman Ray, Deputy Council President Ray, Ray. whatever you are. <laughs> um, just a couple, so you talk about the population that we would serve, can you uh, put a box around that for me, who you envision this homeless population is, and how many people we think that is? Great question, thank you so much. Uh, so definitely our um, proposed project would be to focus on Issaquah, um, and so the limits, the geographical limits of Issaquah. Um, as far as providing an exact um, number for um, how many homeless individuals in Issaquah we may have, um, it is unknown at this time. Uh, we have official data from the um, Countess Inn, um, projects, however, those numbers are released on a regional basis, so we only have numbers for the east side. Uh, for example, uh, the numbers for unsheltered ind individuals on the east side, there are around 340 individuals, total number of individuals who are homeless on the east side are about 900. I don't think that that's fair to um, um, make any estimates on what that means for Issaquah. Um, from um, in, uh, organizations that we work with currently, for example, uh, through the Human Services uh, Funds, we um, support the Catholic Community Meals Program that uh, serves individuals who are homeless. And from their 2019 report, um, they um, noted that they served 38 uh, unique individuals who are homeless in Issaquah. Um, another number it comes from the McKinney-Vento data uh, that shows us that uh, in 2018 there were 172 homeless students in the Issaquah School District. So between those numbers we can make estimates. Uh, the exact number is unknown and we do hope that actually the outreach staff will provide us with, will help us get a better feel for what homelessness looks like in Issaquah. Did that answer your question a little bit? I, th I think so. Um, it's, it's not a big number, but it's an unknown right. number. Mm -hmm. And we're targeting people who are um, homeless and dwelling inside the city limits. That's kind of our, our target yes. um, population. Mm -hmm. yes. um, who are we currently contracting with to provide services? You mentioned that there were 
where multiple groups we're currently getting services from? Yes, so the three organizations that we currently fund for outreach services um, are the Sophia Way, uh, Congregations for the Homeless, and Friends of Youth. Uh, so Friends of Youth focuses on uh, outreaching to youth. Um, uh, Sophia Way focuses on outreaching to women, and then they also have a contract with King County to outreach uh, to individuals who reside in vehicles, and uh, Congregations for the Homeless provides outreach to men. Thanks. So um, love the table, love the comparison of kind of what we're doing today to what we're doing or we're envisioning tomorrow. I have a little bit of trouble, quite honestly, um, rationalizing how $60,000 is gonna get us um, 40 hours a week, because that's not enough money to fund an FTE and 40 hours a week, you won't get a full FTE. So what's what's was the thinking coming up with those um, service levels? Thank you so much. Uh, yes, um, we actually reached out to a couple of nonprofits here locally in Issaquah, and we asked for um, how much um, a full-time staff is paid with, and um, they did say that around fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars. It's a um, accurate estimate for um, almost full-time or full-time staff, um, and so that's what we based our estimates on. Um, uh, yes, I think the number does not include all the benefits that that would come with, so then I think uh, we would hope to leverage some additional dollars, but um, that's why, you know, the hope is that at least, if not a completely full-time staff, maybe a 30-hour staff we could fund with those. And, and you had mentioned that one of the upsides to doing this is to provide a conduit to services that we currently provide. Mm -hmm. Do we think we have excess capacity to, I mean, if we brought more people to the door, do we have the capacity to serve that population. Yes, uh, great, thank you. Um, through the current monitoring system for the current human services grants, uh, we noticed that um, many of the services that are, I mentioned are not utilized hardly at all by Issaquah residents. So right now, in other words, we, we invest dollars that our Issaquah residents do not um, use. Um, and so our hope is that with an outreach staff, um, they at least would utilize the services that we already fund. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Other you. questions? Seeing none, uh, care for a motion? Council President Hunt. I move to proceed with the recommended funding approach to the 2021-2022 Human Services Grant Cycle, including a contract for designated services, a grassroots grant, and traditional human services funding, and proceed with utilizing the allocated funds for designated services to support local outreach services as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Been moved and seconded. Is there any council discussion? Councilmember Rick, Deputy Council President Ray. <laughs> so as, as I talked about at the study session, I think homelessness is a significant issue that's facing the region and, and, it, and it is touching a squaw and we're not um, beyond it. I have trouble with the idea of targeting homeless outreach specifically because in December 18th, King County created the King County Regional Homeless Authority, whose mission is specifically, and I'm, I'm quoting here because this, um, coordinate all outreach, diversion, shelter, rapid rehousing, transition housing, permanent supportive housing, and, um, and some of the region's preventative um, efforts. Also, when it talks about Sound Cities, it talks about the fact that with strong support from Sound Cities, the new organization will also develop sub-regional plans as part of the overall response plan. So what we are doing is um, completely duplicative of what King County, Sound Cities, and the City of Seattle have already committed to do, and they are well down the road, and they will be operational by the 1st of January 2021. And if we let grants for this, we would be operational for 2021. So I, two things, I completely support the need to do something for homeless. I think outreach is the wrong thing for us to focus on. I think there are plenty of really good things we could focus on. Um, I would love to see us um, double down on 
providing services to homeless kids who are in the Esquaw High School because those are our kids and I would like to provide services to them. I would be super supportive of a program that was focused on um, keeping people who live in Issaquah from becoming homeless, so um, supports for those people. I just don't think that the best use of our money, given what's going on regionally and where um, King County is devoting $57 million and City of Seattle is investing $75 million and we're going to put $50,000 in it, that we are going to move the needle at all. And I would rather us put those $50,000 where I think they can make a significant impact on the community. And I just don't, I can't support this is the best use of our money to do homeless outreach to the 50, 100, whatever homeless people who may today live inside the boundaries of the city of Issaquah. Thank you. Are there other comments? Uh, Council President Hunt. Firstly, I wanted to thank the members of the commission who have come today for the Human Services Commission. It's always excellent to hear directly from commissioners about their work, and we really uh, are very appreciative of that and also appreciative of your ongoing efforts on behalf of the city. I think that the commission's work is very important, and I think that um, my understanding of what their presenting here and what you presented is that this would be a new approach for some of the human services grants that would be designated in a different way to try to get more results. And so I think that, um, in my opinion, I think that the approach has been justified and that I think it should be given a chance. And the other thing is that I think it's been very, um, that it's been very compelling and been repeated many times that Issaquah cannot provide all of the services that are necessary for wraparound services um, for, for residents. And that a lot of times what we need to do in that is to be effective is to connect people with services that are not within the city. And so I think that outreach is the first step in making sure that people understand how to get the services they need. And we know that we don't have all of those wraparound services within the city. So I, I um, think this makes sense. I wanted to thank again the commission and I will be supportive. Thank you. Other comments? Uh, Councilmember D. Michelle. Um, I, I too am really impressed with the response to our uh, work study session, and I think you answered all of the, all of the questions and more that we asked. So, uh, really appreciate that and the work of the Human Services Commission. Uh, and thank you, Loretta, for your comments. That was very very good. I think it's been a, a good dialogue back and forth. I think it's really important for us to understand that we're not being asked to increase human services funding, and if we don't approve this going forward, we'll still be spending the same amount of money. It will be going for services that the staff and the Human Services Commission have already told us are not being used effectively. There is no plan B here. Uh, we have this proposal, or we are do it the way we've always done it, and the way we've always done it is uh, has clearly been identified as not as effective as it could be. Um, I also like the idea that we're doing a pilot program because um, in my mind, government should be um, uh, nimble and it should be uh, in, uh, interactive. And if we try this and we see areas where we can improve even more, the second year we'll be able to do that. And we're not committed to uh, hiring an individual. We're on a contract basis. So I think the pilot program approach is, is really good. Um, I wanted to talk about the hidden homelessness in Issaquah because in my last nine years working with the um, Issaquah Community Network and then the Issaquah Schools Foundation and then the garage, I slowly but surely became acutely aware of how hidden youth homelessness, and I'm sure that applies to other uh, homeless segments, um, is in Issaquah. Um, Monica was talking about the um, McKinney-Vento figures, 172 students. But if you talk to the school district staff, if you talk to school district counselors, they will tell you that the numbers are really double or triple that. And the reason is that in Issaquah, it is very hard for a teenager to admit that he or she is 
homeless. But uh, they do come forward eventually, and as Zach said, they will ask for a place to stay or can you help me get services? And then on that same end, I have found out how hard it is uh, to get those services to young people in our community. It's, there's a big disconnect between what people need and where the service is. And if it's in Seattle, then you have to figure out how are we gonna get them there? You know, how are we gonna do that? Um, we don't have those services here, and so we need to figure out how we're gonna do that. And that really takes someone who's very adept at figuring out exactly what each individual person needs and how we can get them that help. So um, the numbers, I think, are, no matter what number we come up with, it's gonna be lower than the actual number that we have. Um, I was happy with that we have benchmarks. I've talked to that before as well. I'm used to uh, responding to these, uh, putting in reports, and it's always about the numbers. And I think let's, I mean, we need to know the numbers, but let's also talk about, are we making a difference in anybody's lives? Are we moving the needle forward? Are we meeting goals? Um, and then last but not least, I wanna say that I also, I really approve of that small uh, grassroots grants that you're talking about. Uh, again, if we're trying to move our community to a more equitable community where everybody has a chance to participate in the opportunities, um, we recognize that there are barriers to that participation in some groups in our community. And I think this is, a, again, a pilot program where we can correct what we've done if it's not working, but we can give that opportunity to more people with that small amount of, of money that we're reallocating. So, um, I am very pleased with the proposal and I will be supporting it. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm also gonna be supporting this measure this evening. Um, I, I really understand and appreciate um, Councilmember Ray's concerns about duplicative efforts, um, but in regards to homelessness, one way to think about this is to compare to uh, another, uh, effort that we have, which is uh, emergency preparedness. So when you have emergency preparedness, you have response, you have actors at the federal level, which basically write checks. You have folks at the state level that provide big resources. You have folks at the county level that do a bunch of heavy lifting. And then you have folks at the local level uh, that are involved as well and, and sort of making sure that the last mile gets covered. And I see this as, as related to that last mile. Uh, I get that the county's got, will have some number of millions of dollars, but it, it, it won't be the last mile. It will be to provide grants and it will be to try to directly uh, provide monies towards getting people into, uh, into housing. Um, this is different. And so uh, I think it's, a, it's great. I appreciate the Human Services Commission and our staff putting this together and explaining it so well. And I'm also confident that if we should find ourselves in a situation where we do have overlapping services in a year, um, then uh, you know that, that brief overlap would be fine because we'll, we'll, we will adapt and we will figure out other ways to respond to this critical problem. But um, throughout, uh, really throughout all of Western Washington, this, the homelessness crisis continues to grow. Um, and uh, I think being proactive and thinking outside the box on how we as a community want to contribute towards, as I said again, that last mile, uh, I'm, I'm proud of the city for putting together this proposal and, and happy to support it. Thank you, Councilmember Mertz. Are there any other comments this evening? Uh, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you. Um, thank you again for um, bringing back additional information and thank you to the Human Services Commission for um, having a special meeting and coming and reporting back to us. I really appreciate all the work that you've done. Um, I don't disagree with um, Council Member Ray's comments. Um, and I do think we need to find the right uh, focus for our community. I don't know exactly what that is. Um, and I too don't want any duplicative monies spent. And so I agree on that. On, on that. Um, I guess the thing that uh, tips the scales for me is this is a pilot program. And so I, I, th I would like to see what the results are of this pilot program. So I will support this. 
um, but I will be looking for precise results um, the next time this comes around. And, uh, I'm, and uh, on another thought is I'm not quite sure we've figured out exactly what the best way it is for us to, um, to um, spend not just this particular pilot program, but, um, but our funding for um, the human services. I'm not quite sure we're there yet. Um, but I will support this tonight because it's a pilot and I will be looking for the results later to see how we could do um, different or better. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any other comments? Council Member Hall? Yeah, I won't repeat what's um, been said this evening. Um, I will also be supporting uh, this agenda bill this evening. Um, I'm happy to support it because it is a pilot, proje pilot project um, as um, Councilmember Goodman had mentioned, uh, completely agree with her on that, and I'm looking forward to kind of seeing the metrics that come out of this and how we move forward with it. Um, I also want to say that I agree with um, Deputy Council President Ray uh, that we should be supporting organizations working in the space of housing assistance and preventing um, families and individuals that live here in Issaquah from becoming homeless in the first place. In my mind, I see that as kind of the highest aim that the city of Issaquah should be thinking about. Um, but um, I think that's more of a long-term discussion. How do we go about doing that? Where is our role in this space? But for tonight, I am absolutely in support of uh, this agenda bill and um, looking forward to seeing uh, how it plays out. Thank you, Council Member Hall. You did repeat a few things, just saying. <laughs> Is there any other council members that would like to make comment? Council member, uh, Deputy Council President Ray. I just want to close on one point, and that is, I think this is really, I mean, homelessness is very important, and I'm very supportive of that. I would really feel more comfortable if we were to um, narrow our scope and take our resources and pinpoint them at a specific, very tangible population. So I want to put that out there as something to consider moving forward. I also think it is very, um, I think it's incorrect to say that we are, our, our um, use of human services has, has been ineffective because we, we, I heard that a couple times tonight. Less effective. <laughs> Less effective. Um, I think that um, our service providers do an amazing job and if I go back to our November 26th meeting when we looked at our needs assessment, we have infinite amount of unfilled human services needs. And so our question really is, how do we best use the limited resources we have to fill whatever needs we can? And if the belief is that this is the best use of our limited resources to make the biggest impact on the people of Issaquah, then that's the right thing to do. But going forward with this pilot, I guess I wanna see that we come back and say, yeah, those were the best, that was the best use of those dollars we spent because we have so many unfilled needs in this community. Thank you, Deputy Council President. Any other comments before I call for the vote? Council Member Goodman? So I don't know if this is what um, Council Deputy President Ray is um, saying, so I'll say it in a completely different way. I, I don't disagree at all. I mean, I agree with his comments. Um, and I'm, what I'm hoping out of this is that we learn a lot. I don't, what I'm not excited about is um, voting for something that just makes me feel good, that I put some money towards something. I know it's a huge problem. It's a, it's a crisis in three counties and not just here, but in different places all over the state. Um, and so I, I, like I said, I'm not looking for putting money at something just to say I put mon money towards something. I want them, I want results and I want to know what we got for our money and if the Human Services Commission believes that this is the target for right now, this is the focus, um, then I believe the Human Services Commission. But again, I want to see what the results are. Thank you. Any other additional or final comments? Seeing none, I'll go through the motion. All those in favor of proceeding with the recommended funding approach to the 2021-2022 Human Services Grant Cycle, including a contract for designated services, a grassroots grant, and traditional human services funding, 
and proceeding with utilizing the allocated funds for designated services to support local outreach services as presented. Signify by saying aye. 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 Those against? That um, passes unanimously. And that takes us to our last regular business item this evening, AB 7908, utilizing a portion of the RV park for transit-oriented development relocation site. And the request before the council is to, I'm break. I'm getting a look from at least a couple of folks that we need a five minute break. Okay, we're taking a five minute break before we start this item. I think we call those recess. Well, there were some heads like going down. <laughs>
Okay. We are back from our recess and we're on our last item under regular business, utilized portion of the RV park for transit oriented development relocation site and the council action this evening is to consider approving this request. This item was before council at the January 28th council study session and economic development manager, oh, nope, got that one wrong. <laughs> Deputy city administrator Snyder is at the podium to give us some information. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor and good evening everyone. Um, uh, I am here with a team of folks who are um, ready to present on this topic, including Jen Davis Hayes, the Economic Development Manager, as well as uh, David Fujimoto, um, who's with the Office of Sustainability, Hal Ferris from Spectrum Development, and Dan Landis from King County Housing Authority. And uh, the decision before City Council tonight is whether you are supportive of using a portion of the RV Park site in support of the Transit Oriented Development and Opportunity Center. If the City Council does not approve the use of the land as a relocation site for CenturyLink, then the TOD project will not continue. And uh, before I move ahead, I just wanna be really uh, recognizing of your time this evening, knowing that this is the last item on regular business and that we also anticipate a fairly long uh, executive session, a little short of an hour. And so um, we've provided a lot of material and information in the packet this evening. We have uh, 30 plus slides to go over in this presentation for you tonight. But I wanted to take this moment to press pause and take the temperature of council whether you wanted us to proceed and run through the presentation as planned in recognition of the, ta of the time tonight or, um, or if you wanted to uh, we, we can do a high level summary as part of the presentation and open up the opportunity for you to ask questions and discuss. Thoughts? Councilmember D. Michelle? Um, again, you responded so well to our work study session that there is, I feel like there's a lot of information that might be new to the public. Um, I know all of us have read through it and understand it. So I guess I would like a high level summary where maybe you touch uh, a little bit on some of the new information as well as the information that was put together for the what's the need for this project. Um, that would be my, I, I, I understand that we are time limited and we don't need to go over everything, but I do think there's some things that the public needs to understand to understand you know, what we are talking about. So. I'm looking at the rest of the body, uh, head nods, uh, Councilman Martz. Yeah, I mean, this is this has been two years and many votes, and I want to make sure that uh, all of us and the community understand the vote that's before us tonight before we make take that vote. So um, there are a lot of slides. What I'm hearing is that 30,000 foot level, but please touch on everything that is new information because it'll be new to the council. Um, so it's a bit of an accelerated presentation, but it's not an abbreviated presentation. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, we will uh, we will proceed in that way, and um, I will uh, still be asking for the members of the project team to help come up and uh, be uh, provide that high level overview and follow up of information that you requested from last time. And indeed, that is where we have focused this evening. As I said, there is a lot of information that we provided in the, in the council packet this evening. And so we are able to answer any questions that you may have tonight, but really we're going to be focusing on uh, the council questions that were asked and our responses to those um, and the new information since the study session. So last time we heard uh, lots of desire for background and context information for why we are doing this project. Um, that's going, that information will in part be provided by Hal Ferris the project, with the project overview. And uh, council also asked us for uh, the affordability levels of the housing that's planned with the transit oriented development project. Um, and uh, Jen Davis Hayes will also be providing some information on the project funding sources, which was again a council question from last time. Other questions that we are prepared to answer uh, from the previous study session include information from past studies regarding Issaquah's human services and affordability needs. And uh, that's where Dan Landis will provide some information on Issaquah's housing affordability. 
as well as uh, David Fujimoto will provide some context about the uh, TOD and Opportunity Center project as it relates to the community needs assessment that the city performed. Um, Jen Davis-Hayes will be talking about the trickle-down effects on other city property and plans if the RV park site were to be used as a relocation site instead of a city operations and maintenance uh, facility expansion. And also Jen will be providing information regarding the recent, uh, recent sale prices of similar properties in the area. Um, but before we dive in, I want to give you a brief update on the conversations that we've had with CenturyLink since we last met. Um, uh, so this, this slide here is a picture of their current facility in Issaquah. And uh, since the council last met on this subject, we met with CenturyLink to determine their interest in the relocation site, that is the, the RV park site being proposed. And CenturyLink remains interested. They extended their regrets uh, to you, city council, for not being able to be here tonight. Um, but they may be reaching out to you separately regarding their interest and continued engagement in this project. Um, in our conversations with CenturyLink since we last met with a U City Council, uh, they had additional, a few additional questions about the relocation site. And the project team is currently addressing these and we will regroup with CenturyLink in the beginning of March to discuss um, how we've been addressing some of those issues. One of the questions that we received um, from last time is a general overview of why we are pursuing the TOD uh, project and Opportunity Center project. And um, this is a main summary slide as to, uh, essentially we are looking to replace the facility that you saw on the last slide, this facility, with, um, in order to make progress on some of the goals as outlined in the Central Issaquah Plan. So some of those goals are create housing in the urban core and regional growth center, um, increase affordable housing options, uh, increase access to nonprofit services, and encourage transit use. There are also a number of city studies and policies that um, are supportive of this project, and you will hear more at a very high level from Hal Ferris. Hal, if you can come up and talk about the project overview and elements. Thank you. Yes, I'm Hal Ferris with Spectrum Development Solutions. Um, Mayor Polly and members of the council, I appreciate the time that you've taken again with this um, project. It's it's a large project and it take these take a long time. This one has taken longer. Um, we, we, you've supported this project along the way. We've had many votes that the council's been behind. We've had community outreach and, and open houses that we've informed the public of what, what was going on and received their comment and modified the project as a result of that. And we would have been much further along the way until uh, last September when CenturyLink rejected the uh, King County Roads maintenance site and put us back to where we are today to get a new site that the city has at least put forth to you to be able to support for this project um, as consideration. And we, we have other uh, milestones to get over before we really can, can re-engage on the design of the project. We, we really do need to get everybody bound and committed to uh, uh, land control on the site. Uh, we spent a lot of money uh, up to this point and time and effort on everybody's part uh, without that. But that's where we are today and we have to just keep moving forward with the steps it takes to get the project to move forward. Um, for an, an overview as part of a, re a refresher, um, and maybe new to some people is that the project is made up of two buildings. There are right now planned a 355 plus total residential units. Uh, approximately half of those will be rent restricted and affordable for the life of the project. So this is not a limited affordability period of time. This is the life of the project. Uh, in addition to the affordable units, there is a 34,000 square feet of commercial space of which 10,000 of it is the Opportunity Center. A little over 10,000 is for the uh, anticipated for the Northwest Kidney Center and Bright Horizons has a daycare along with amenities that are for the residents of the building that are enclosed in the building. We also have 100% of the parking is structured. Structured parking is very expensive to build and it's all contained within the footprint of the building 
as a way to try to preserve the site, the openness, and to maximize the amount of units that we can build on the site. Uh, we also have a quarter acre public plaza, that's the bright green that's adjacent to Tibbet. So after hearing the parks plan, we would very much like, hopefully if the project goes forward, that we can coordinate our open space with the parks plan or whatever that might be so that both sides of the street are embraced along that area of the frontage. Uh, the next page, um, this. Uh, people have asked what is, so what I just showed you is not changed from we, the, the concept design has not been advanced since we were last in front of council. We really need to get the site under control at binding agreements before, with CenturyLink before we can advance it further. And when we come back with uh, the legal agreements and certainly with our development and our site development permit plan, we will have a lot more definition into the architecture and the layout of the buildings and all the other amenities that would be part of the project. But that has not changed from when we were before you last uh, spring. The number of units are in terms of affordability levels, and, and Dan can speak to this a little bit, but we've got 24 units that are primarily large three bedroom units that will be at 40% um, or below of area median income. So those are, he can keep the affordability levels, but basically families earning less than 40,000 a year. Uh, then we've got 131 units that are between 40 and 60% of area median income and uh, 20 uh, units that are at 80% of area median income. So we have basically half of our total units are permanently affordable. Um, when, when we responded to the RFP, um, our team with the Housing Authority ourselves, there were requested to have 200 units total of which 100 were affordable. But to try to bring down the total cost per unit and utilize the land better, we as a team have been what has increased the total number of units and kept that ratio in terms of the amount of affordable units consistent with the total market side. And we think it's important to have that mixed income community together mm -hmm. to make it successful. Um, the other, um, what has changed um, <coughs> is the project budget has not surprisingly gone up as a result of the delay, not because what we're building is, is bigger, but it, the cost of construction goes up every year that goes by. We had anticipated escalation for the period of time it was going to take. This has all pushed us out another year. So it basically we are seeing an increase in construction cost of six to seven million dollars per year for each year that's delayed. So this is the combination of all the funding that goes into the project. Um, we have a market rate loan. Uh, we have equity from investors that are going in. Those are the two pieces that go into the market rate side. The rest of the sources of funding largely, which is typical for what the affordable housing developer has to do, they have to put together you know, six or seven or eight or nine sources of funding to build an affordable housing project. So that's a very challenging. Uh, Dan can go into more detail, but there's tax exempt bond financing, low income housing tax credits, the $10 million King County TOD fund, that's what one of the things that initiated the whole thing was when King County put that out there and the Housing Authority was successful in securing the whole $10 million for the project. That funding doesn't increase even though the project goes up, so it becomes less impactful over time. Uh, the commercial tenants, that is the Kidney Center wants to pay, for, wants to own their space and that's the amount of money that they would be contributing to own their space um, is $9 million. The rest of the tenants, um, the um, um, daycare uh, would be a ten, uh, would pay rent. They don't, wouldn't put money in. Uh, the housing authority uh, is making a loan themselves and deferring some of their fee. Uh, and then the city waive fees, uh, three million. That is we. That is money that if this was all market rate, that money would be paid. But because you're waiving it, that's what goes and allows the housing authority to lower the rents that they charge to their tenants is the result of lowering the cost in the reduction of the waste. So these, this, these, that item is not money that the city's contributing out of their treasury. It's money that you don't collect if this had otherwise been a fully market rate project. Then there's $2 million from ARCH. And the last is the million dollars, the city's portion of the property taxes. There's also the state and county that contributed. All of that is going to reduce the rent, the, the affordability for the, um, the units. That doesn't go to, to increase fees or anything else. It just is what subsidizes the rents or the reduction in the property taxes and the other fees that are waived. I think we have a, a quick question here. Thank you, Mr. Goodman. Okay. So, um, so the $1 million MFTE that the property taxes 
that um, the city would normally collect that would not be collected by the city. Um, how, is that for a, a, the total over a period of years? Yes, the tax exemption that's allowed by the state is for 12 years. And the affordability that uh, is permanent affordability. So the, 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 after the 12 years is up, the, the market rate side pays its full amount in property taxes. So in one of the slides that you have at the back of your packet, there, over the life of the project, the project will pay um, um, uh, almost six million dollars in property taxes. This, you know, that will that will come into the city, the city's portion. But the, this one million dollar MFTE, that's the total for twelve years. Yes. Okay. Thanks. The total amount for twelve years. Councilmember Martz. Couple of questions. Um, first off, this adds up to one seventy nine, not one seventy. Yeah, I added that up. My, I, I did that just to see if somebody was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're on. You're on top of it. So. Um, the, the the second question I have is in the next slide, you're going to talk about a city five million dollar commitment. How does that five million dollars relate to the numbers that are on this page? Um, what, what part of this adds up Julian. to the five the, the okay. cities? Okay. Artists? Um, this, this, the city um, is, you uh, passed a while back, is uh, $3 million, it's, it's not in this list, $3 million, is, this is just for the Opportunity Center. The $5 million is just for the Opportunity Center. $3 million of it is going to pay for part of its core and shell, and about $2 million is going to the tenant improvements inside the space, and that would, that depends upon how you negotiate your lease with um, the the operator or the um, health point as to whether you give them a TI allowance or whether you you know build out the space for them. But that's where that's it's the five million dollars that the city is on the sixth slide is all money that's going to the opportunity center and it's not included in these totals. So these totals are just for the residential. It's for plus... everything except for the build out of the opportunity center. Okay. It includes the the. Uh, kidney center includes the building the shell space for the for the uh, daycare the daycare will build out their own space you know the t tenant improvements inside the space and the cost they're going to spend is not included in this total either so this rest of it is for the residential the site work the streets you know the um, everything else that goes into building the project um, but it just doesn't include the improvements for the now, I would like to point out is the the size of the Kidney Center, you see their number is nine million, and what the city is paying is five million. So this project is still subsidizing the Opportunity Center to the tune of four million dollars. That's how much more it would cost you if you were to do it on your own, as the Kidney Center is doing. Thank you. Any other questions on the financials? Because I know this has been something that you've been asked about a lot. Otherwise, we'll move on. Uh, Councilmember Goodman, I didn't quite understand the last. Thing you were talking about the kidney center four million mm -hmm. subsidy. I didn't get that. The, the the kidney center the size of their space is almost identical to the um, mm -hmm. opportunity center, and they're paying for their full share, their proportionate mm -hmm. share of the of the street, of the land, of the everything. And and when we responded to the RFP, one of our requirements was to provide ten thousand square feet of shell space for the um, opportunity center. And that was something that we had to just supply. It wasn't part of the zoning code. It was just something we, we had to include in our proposal. And so that's why the Opportunity Center is only having to put in $5 million as compared to the Kidney Center that's putting in nine is because part of the, the project is, is subsidizing the Opportunity Center. Like everybody else is paying okay. the condo fees except the Opportunity right. Center. Mm -hmm. All the rest is paid. Mm -hmm. yeah. so we're just not sharing in that cost. Yeah. Any other questions on the financials before we keep going through the deck? Okay. Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ferris. Thank you. Um, Jen Davis Hayes, Economic Development Manager, and thanks, Hal, for covering part of my next slides. That's wonderful. And he'll be here, you know, everybody will be able, available for additional questions. Um, so as uh, Hal mentioned, uh, this is a breakdown of, of information that was requested from the last council session about how the Opportunity Center, Opportunity Center will be funded. Um, so originally in the agenda bill that was presented to uh, council in December of 2018, 
We talked about the $965,000 coming from the remaining city mitigation funding for human services and uh, the remainder being a bond and debt is issuance that be repaid from lease payments. Uh, on that, in that agenda bill, we talked about the sources uh, to pay, repay that, the lease payments, uh, estimated at $250,000 per year. Now, I wanna note we did not, we have not negotiated a lease with HealthPoint and have that locked down. That was based on their response in the RFP about their ability to pay per square foot. So as we move forward, if we move forward and negotiate with them uh, with a lease for the Opportunity Center, we will have um, more information we bring back to you about the actual lease rates and what contribution they will contribute towards tenant improvements and what contribution we will as well. Um, and then as you all know, uh, the state has awarded us $3 million towards the Opportunity Centers that reduces our commitment um, to up to $1,085,000. Yes, sir. So would it be fair, if you put all this together, would it be fair to say this is um, this is potentially an investment of a million dollars roughly for the city with a payback of about five years and beyond that it becomes cash positive? Yes, yes, so after after uh, the, if we uh, issue a bond or debt or we get, put something out of our rainy day fund and pay that back, after that, that, that those resources are, come to us then, yes. We would have um, a condominium fee that would help pay for what's available, but we would work that into the lease payments and uh, then those resources would be available for other uses of the city. Thank you. And then the second part of that, and again, some of this uh, Hal has addressed is, so what other commitments do, do we, will we have as the city? And so, to be fair, so in 2020, this year, we will uh, invest some resources to do uh, appraisals on the King, former King County Road site, as well as the portion of the RV park if we proceed. And so then again, looking at that to find out what the fair market value is, we will have an independent appraiser do that, um, and that will be utilized for the deal points which we bring back to you in the property exchange trend, uh, agreement later this year. And then uh, moving forward, of course, uh, the city is facilities assessment uh, the unknown timing of that, uh, we have 10 plus years question mark, but that is another resource that would be, have to be spent by council, whether or not we actually ha move forward with the TOD because that is a, um, a uh, re-evaluation that's necessary because of the timing ch and changes in this, uh, the, the assumptions of the time. Um, so some of the things that um, Hal Point mentioned here is in your packet, um, there was some additional information provided about what the Opportunity Center will actually uh, cost, uh, uh, provide, bring in resources, and so that is uh, Exhibit G, I believe, yes. And so um, the three million dollars in wave fees, again, that is what we are not collecting. Um, and that is av available for any affordable housing project. So if somebody came in and, and, and uh, developed one affordable house, housing unit, they would be eligible for those wave fees. Um, the $1 million in property taxes over 12 years, we will still continue to collect property taxes on the land and on the commercial properties and over those 12 years. And then also, uh, if CenturyLink moves over to the RV park, we'll continue to, to you know, collect their portion of um, property taxes in the new location. So, um, and then as far as the new information that's presented here is the fees and taxes collected and the development team figured this out. So what, what fees to develop the new CenturyLink relocation site and then also what fees for and taxes collected for the TOD. And so that adds up to about $5 million. And then as mentioned again before, the over the lifetime we anticipate um, over $5 million of, of for the city alone uh, collection of property taxes, which currently on the our, on the um, CenturyLink site is less for the city alone annually is less than um, five thousand dollars. So this gives an overview, kind of a little bit bigger picture about not just um, uh, what what uh, contributions towards the TOD, but what also will be coming in as as real revenue sources to the city um, immediately and then over the lifetime. Yes. I'm still a little confused. Right now we have an old utility facility and hillside, and if this goes through, we have a big residential and commercial and service uh, facility and a spiffy new utility center. And what is the delta in revenues to the city as a result of going from 
the first picture to the second picture? Because I, I don't quite see it in these numbers. Sure, so the second box here, which is future property tax collect, that's just for the TOD. So um, $5.6 million over the lifetime of the project. Um, we, we assume that, and again, we're not looking at extrapolating out uh, what the value of the, the new CenturyLink site is, et cetera. Um, but in our assumptions, we just said, okay, assume that they're gonna pay the same amount. It's a little complicated, I will tell you, if you actually look in King County Assessor's Office database, our, our website, it says that they're, t they're uh, exempt, but it's, it's not. It's a, it's a unique rule in the Washington State where utilities are charged at the state, at the state level, so it's not con different rates on each city and then it's and it's kind of shared with the jurisdictions so mm -hmm. it's a little more complicated than let's look at what the assessed value is because it is outside of uh, king county's uh calculations actually so so to say all that uh basically we assume the same at, at the future century link but it, it could be higher um go on did it okay um Provided a more detailed timeline again in your packet. Um, I, I'm uh, for the uh, for time. If there's any questions about any of the timelines, I had on this slide just some real basic things. Um, really, the TOD project started to become reality in 2016. Um, and a couple of things happened where we identified the surplus site from King County to actually be able to relocate CenturyLink because they were had not plans to move and wanted to stay in the area, but we didn't have a site for them. Um, and then the, the TOD fund uh, was created in mid-2016 with that allocation just for, is, for I-90 Issaquah to North Bend. Um, so that really then started the ball rolling on this process. Is there any questions? Generally, go on. Okay, so I'm gonna turn over to Dan Landis oh, from sorry, uh, Council Member Goodman oh, yes. question. Yes, the, the MOUs that we had now, yeah. are those um, expired? So the one with, we had two different MOUs. We have one with King County, Spectrum, and, and um, City. And that one, I don't think had an expiration date. It did? Okay, so they are, they're, what's that? It expired. It expired. So yes, they are both expired. I knew that the CenturyLink one about the site exclusivity um, did expire and we amended it once and then they were not interested in amending again. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Dan. Good evening, my name is Dan Landis. I'm with King County Housing Authority. We're the housing authority for all cities in King County outside of Seattle and Renton. And uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of the housing needs data that uh, influenced our interest in going after the RFP when it came out by the city of Issaquah. So um, what, what you see on this chart here, the blue bars, that's the median income for the city of Issaquah uh, per the American Community Survey from 2007 through 2017, the last year that data was available. And you can see there's been good steady growth, uh, even with a little bit of a spike between 2016 and 2017 in income, which is a good thing for the city. I juxtaposed over the top of that what's been happening with average two bedroom rents in the city. And you can see that in uh, 2010, the rents hit their lowest uh, after the recession. And from that point through 2017, uh, rents grew by 54%, while at the same time, the income in the city grew by 20%. So you can see, even though Issaquah has had healthy income growth over time, the rents have far exceeded that. It's even worse when you look at the home ownership costs in Issaquah. Um, I don't have this on this slide, but according to the Zillow Home Value Index, home prices bottomed out in 2012, a little bit later than the rents. And since that time, they've grown by 197%, so about tripled. So th this slide is based on a data that HUD compiles from the census. Uh, and what they do is they break, uh, they want to determine who actually is living with a housing cost burden. And so, uh, they define housing cost burden as a household that pays more than 30% of their income for housing costs. And those who are severely house, uh, housing cost burden pay more than half of their income. So the bars on here, the red means that those are, that's the households that pay more than half of their income. Yellow means over 30% and green means that they live in a housing that they can afford. Um, 
these five bars on here on the left, that represents households from zero to 30% of the area median income. And this is the area median income, which is King County's median income, not just the city of Issaquah. Issaquah has a higher median income than the county as a whole. Uh, so you can see that, um, that uh, households with less than 30% of the area median income, two thirds of them, are, pay half of their income or more for their housing costs. Uh, if you look at the first three, so zero to 80 percent, 45 percent of all households <laughs> below 80 percent in the city of Issaquah pay more than half of their income for rent. So it's a it's a huge issue, and they're not small numbers. You can see that 985 plus 545, it, it, it works out to a lot of households with low incomes that are paying rents that they cannot afford or living in homes that they can't afford. Um, if you look all the way over to the right, that's uh, households with uh, incomes above the median and uh, that those, the yellow down at, their, at the bottom, that's almost all people who have uh, mortgages that they can't afford. So it tends to be uh, uh, homeowners above 100%. I think once you move to the left, it, the percentage of households that are renters grows and grows. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a huge issue. Supply of new housing is part of addressing the housing problem, but private, the private market alone will not address housing affordability for low and moderate income households. Issaquah has added over 1,500 new one, two, and three bedroom apartments since 2015. And the average rent for one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom house, uh, apartments in those com complexes is equal to about 90, what, what one with 94 or 95% of the area median could afford. So really you're just looking at the, a portion of the, the fourth bar and then all of the fifth bar. The, all of those households on the left are not being served by the new housing that's being built in the city of Issaquah. And the fact is private developers need to charge those rents in order to be able to afford the cost of construction for building them because it's so expensive now. The prices of home ownership are even worse. There's a, a new development down the street from the transit center where two bedroom townhomes are going for $700,000 a unit. And that works out to, according to the Redfin calculator, if you had a 5% down payment, you would need $180,000 in annual income in order to afford a $700,000 two bedroom townhome, or you'd be at 180% of the area median income. Just for those of you who are wondering about the area median income, this is a chart that shows you where Issaquah's population falls. So 63% of the population has an income above 100% of area median. So it's a fairly wealthy community, but still 29% have incomes below 80% of the area median income. So you can see that it, it, there are a, a, a large number of households, a, a significant percentage of Issaquah's population is being impacted severely by these uh, rising housing costs. And just so to, to put a little bit of, so, so you can understand what, what various area median income uh, levels mean. 40 per, I, I'll let you read this, I won't go, go through all of this, but a lot of people that work in Issaquah, uh, and all of these are, are what people who work in these jobs at Issaquah are earning. They, they are not being able to find affordable housing. And, and our research shows that the, the um, one of the keys to success for low-income households is that they can live close to where they work and send their kids to good schools. And so it's really part of our mission to make sure that people who have low incomes in communities like Issaquah are able to stay in those communities mm -hmm. and uh, uh, achieve family success. Oh, sorry, Councilmember Goodman? Yeah. The, can you go back one slide, please? Thank you. Um, so where do you get the um, information for the um, salaries, for the income for these categories? Sorry, this was the one slide that I presented that I did not prepare. <laughs> so I'm going to ask. Sorry. I find the source. I have it on the bottom. Is it? We'll get Jen to come up with that when she has it. Great. Yeah. Oh, for yeah. King and Snow. Sure. I can find you the source. Um, could you okay. actually say that on the microphone, Dan? Because so, so these represent the average income for 
uh, these professions in King and Snohomish County yeah. from okay. state data. Yeah, and if you can get the reference, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, Councilmember Member Michelle. Well, are you finished? No, I just, the reason that I asked is because a spot check um, shows that the incomes here are actually higher. This, that's not for meant these to be. Positions. Yeah, for these not meant to be anything pointed or negative. Just I, I I'm not sure that that's completely accurate. I, I, Michelle? I don't think we ever talked about what is the area median income, uh, and I, it it was on one of the slides, but it is around one hundred and two thousand dollars a year, right? Right for a and, and so eighty percent of of AMI is uh, eighty. Maybe 81. Right. So this 000. is so income is adjusted for family size. So for a one-person household, it's 60,000. For a, uh, I think a, a four-person household, it's 100,000. Right. And so the 40% AMI is uh, 30 to 40. Yeah. So it, you know, it's we have a a high level of income in our community and a high level of uh, of expense as well. And so. Um, the, I can attest that the teachers, I know those salaries, what they are, fall into that 80% category. So, yeah. But it's, uh, I think that a lot of people don't realize that our average median income is that high. Are there any other questions on the slide before we continue? Mm -hmm. And we'll get that um, reference for you. Thank you. David? Good evening, Council, Madam Mayor. Uh, David Fujimoto, Sustainability Director. Uh, so Dan talked a bit about uh, income levels and, and housing affordability in the community. And I'm here uh, with a little bit of information to, about the consideration of the services side of the equation, if you will, and how that reflects community uh, needs and um, how it helps to meet basic uh, human services needs in the community. Um, these uh, services are reflected in goals around uh, developing a healthy community strategy, uh, as well as the provision of services under the housing strategy uh, work plan, uh, specifically housing strategy nine, which does talk about those services uh, for a variety of populations in our community. Uh, back in 2017, the city conducted a community needs assessment um, of health and well being in the community. And this looked at a variety of secondary data sources in, help, in order to help us to better understand the variety of needs in the community. Uh, it also included a variety of uh, interviews with agencies, um, surveys, focus groups, a variety of methodologies to help understand the needs in the community. Um, and it also was uh, assisted with some oversight by a community advisory board of several nonprofit organizations in our community, including HopeLink, International Community Health Services, Swedish Friends of Youth, King County Metro, mm -hmm. Cultural Bridges, the School District, and the Food Bank, among others. Uh, on this slide is a whole lot of information, uh, but basically what it summarizes is some of the key areas uh, or themes that were identified in that community needs assessment. Uh, one of the big ones was uh, disparities by race, ethnicity, sex, and income. Uh, but in addition to that, there were also these specific uh, needs that were identified around access, um, behavioral health, housing costs, and insecurity, which you heard a little bit about, um, and then also child care availability as well. Uh, and this access to services includes limitations of our decentralized service landscape uh, that we find on the east side, ties in with uh, limitations in terms of mobility to access some of those services, many of which are not available in our community, uh, limitations on uh, insurance that's accepted by service providers, uh, as well as linguistically and culturally appropriate, appropriate services. Uh, we also have a variety of information that talks about uh, growing behavioral health needs in the community in terms of health distress, substance use by students, um, a variety of resources to support parents, um, and then a lack of resources for intervention and treatment uh, in the community. Uh, Dan talk, spoke quite a bit about the housing costs and insecurity. Um, the, uh, the lack of ava available basic needs contributes to kind of that housing instability. Um, and then also there's a lack of <coughs> child care availability in the community. In regards to some of the, the past history, um, there is, uh, has been an ongoing body of work in the community for several years to increase access to services for Isquah residents. Uh, some of this work dates back to uh, the work by uh, a 
community group to focus on a human services campus. Uh, this, this body of work took place for many years. Uh, it was community driven. And really the purpose of that was to focus on providing uh, co-located services, uh, looked at some, a variety of best practices, looking at um, the Together Center and Redmond as a potential model for how you can co-locate uh, services, provide uh, one-stop uh, services for residents. Um, and one of the key findings as a body of that work was that there was a, a huge barrier in terms of providing services in the, the fact that uh, low rep market rents were really critical for nonprofit service providers to be able to establish uh, services in the community. Uh, back in 2008, there was a million dollars that was set aside um, that came from mitigation dollars uh, to help support this effort. Um, and after a variety of attempts to identify a suitable location, uh, this uh, body of work was eventually um, uh, can't or discontinued back in 2015 once a, they were not able to find a suitable location. Uh, more recently, as I described before, there was a community needs assessment that was done as a part of a look at our human services and trying to hone in, uh, begin that process of honing in more on the uh, community needs. Um, and that identified several of the pieces I spoke about uh, just on the other slide. Um, and then with the Opportunity Center RFP uh, and the TOD RFP, the city had an opportunity to explore an innovative new model for approaching and addressing this, this uh, barrier to locating services locally. And that was taking a look at the uh, TOD project and identifying a way to incorporate that into that project, uh, the Opportunity Center into the project. Uh, and the goals for the Opportunity Center really were to expand the capacity or enhance services, not just relocate services within the community. Uh, it was to address priority community needs, uh, address the limited availability of affordable land or facility rentals, and to align with several of the TOD components, which were around living, working, supporting, and connecting to the region. So the city solicited proposals for the Opportunity Center, uh, received four different proposals uh, from about nine different agencies, and through that process, uh, selected Health Point and Valley Cities as the leading proponent for that. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my part will start talking about the RV park specifically. As you may remember, um, the CenturyLink on the left, which is in the orange color, uh, the project site, um, we had planned to uh, relocate them to the blue site on the right, which is the former King County Roads property. Um, that was not suitable for their needs, and now we're looking at mm. the site outlined in red, which is a portion of the current RV site. Every RV park. And we have this very pre preliminary uh, site plan. So um, we presented this to CenturyLink after we had a site visit um, to the RV park, with the idea is to determine if the site can accommodate the functions that CenturyLink requires, and if so, it'll be refined from there. So the blue section is the area that would be remaining for the potential for RV park, and so as was uh, stated earlier that uh, we have saved all the sites, that is, uh, spaces for the RV park, unfortunately that is not true. We are looking at potentially having about 17 spaces. Now I will say we did not plan, look at this space and say, can we fit 17, can we fit 20? Um, uh, it's just again, a very preliminary, quick quick look at, can CenturyLink uh, functions be put, placed on the, on the area that we have here? And so far there has been a lot of head nodding and, uh, and then what's remaining. Um, we will uh, continue that conversation and come back to you with um, more uh, information about that. Um, so if we proceed with this, the uh, next question that uh, council had asked us to bring more information about um, as Andrea mm -hmm. referred, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, Councilman Mertz. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, S yeah. 17, what's, uh, <laughs> what's the number 17 sp spaces remaining out of yes. how many? Um, it's 56, yes. So it would be 17 spaces remaining out of 56. 56. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, and do we have uh, an estimate of how many of those 56 were long-term living? So we had heard, heard earlier uh, about 20. We heard uh, tonight about 25 to 28. It, it varies. So um, what we would make sure is, again, look, 
if we proceed with this, looking to see if we can fit as many sites that are, are possible on the site that works for the RV park. We'd also work with the uh, the people who would not have space there and see if we could help them with other locations, um, looking at connecting them to Arch. See, uh, and they would there would be a, a long lead time if we would move forward with this, so it wouldn't be like we say you need to be out in 30 days, um, because we'd probably, um, we would inform, begin to have conversations with the RV park management firm as soon as possible and set a, a timeline for that. So, so that sounds like a loss of eight to 11 um, uh, yes, housing equivalent, mm -hmm. whatever the right term is? Okay, sure. thank you. Mm -hmm. So President Hunt, did you have a question? Just that it, it has said 18 spaces um, several times in our okay. packet. And so I think, I, and I get its estimate, but um, to the extent that it could be consistent. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Continue? Yes, Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so one of the questions is about the trickle down effect and what uh, use, utilizing the RV park for the TOD relocation site would mean to other plans. So we tried to, um, without having a crystal ball, exactly look at, think about the things that would happen with if we use it, utilize the RV park and then if we did not. So uh, if we did use, this slide talks about those impacts, the next slide talks about next steps. So if we did utilize the RV park for the TOD, we obviously would need to re-examine the location size for the operations and maintenance expansion as well as the park's operation uh, relocation. We um, do know, we do believe that there's other sites that can kind of accommodate this future needs, but we're not, we don't have a plan and a, an assessment to uh, determine that at this point. Um, there was questions about Confluence Park phase three. Um, we, we recognize that may be delayed as far as expanding that. When you look in the uh, parks master plan, that was, I'm sorry, strategic plan that was uh, adopted by council, that is a long-term facet to expand um, into Confluence Park phase three. Again, uh, timing for that has not been scheduled, so we, would, we don't really know if, if the uh, moving the parks operations would be aligned with uh, the timing that they planned for phase three. Um, and then we would uh, obviously, as we just discussed, talk about uh, reducing the RV park and that would uh, in turn displace some users. If we did not uh, proceed with utilizing the RV park, as was mentioned before, the, t the TOD project would not move forward. 175 plus units of affordable housing would not be built in uh, the site. And that would also mean zero housing units in our regional growth center. Um, we, the operations and maintenance expansion is still undefined again because of the, um, the long-term uh, 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 the long-term aspect of that, we're not looking to do that as a, as a facility need right now. And so how much space and what needs are, are um, possible for this are things that we'll be looking at in the future years. And the RV park would remain the same as is. Now knowing that if the expansion would happen, okay. uh, the RV park would, was planned to be completely eliminated. So um, again, that would be a later term. Yes. Council Member Hall. Thank you. Um, I heard you and other staff members mention this a, a couple times that if we didn't move forward with this, that um, TOD wouldn't, uh, the project wouldn't move forward. Um, you had just said something about 100 so units wouldn't be constructed, but I thought the total project was like 355. So would there still be market rate housing in the urban? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. So I, I just I was referring to the the affordable housing right. units. Yes. So okay. the the entire project would not move forward. The 355 uh, units would not be built, and the 175 of the affordable would not be added to Issaquah. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry for that. Um, and then looking at the next steps, future steps, as you'll see, I don't need to read these, but uh, a lot of the steps are the same. So again, we don't, we don't know what the future needs assessment would be for the operations and maintenance sites. We currently don't have a policy or, uh, about the centralized or dispersed facilities. There's some differing opinions about whether we should have all our shop sites at one location or have them in different locations throughout the city to, to help better serve our assets. Um, we need to look at what city properties we currently own and how we could utilize those. So those 
need to happen either way. And then again, uh, looking at um, if we utilize the RV park, we, we would need to uh, determine the ability to, re to maintain this as an RV park. We would come back to, with have, having more information and have a conversation with you and potentially relocation assistance. So. Um, another uh, council request was about the property valuation. And so you, I did um, include in your packets the um, King County Roads property appraisal that I referred to in the previous study session that was done in May 2019. So you have the entire appraisal there. Um, and so we've asked Greater Seattle Partners, which is our regional economic development partner, to run us a, a report of all vacant industrial land sales in the last six months. So there were six properties, uh, two in Snoqualmie, one in Redmond, one in Renton, in Bellevue, and Kirkland that were sold in the last six months. And here you have the price range per acre is between 2.2 and 47.4 million. Um, and then uh, there is a property adjacent to the RV park that was just recently sold. We call it the corner property there, um, right along uh, First Avenue. And that uh, sold in uh, January 2019. That price per acre is $951,449. So the intention previously was to kind of give an estimate. We will move forward with doing an appraisal of both the King County Roads property site and the portion of the RV park um, with an independent con uh, appraiser to determine the market value for the land transaction, which is required, of course, to make sure we reimburse the water revenue fund for the, um, if we do transfer this property. So we are actually to the point of talking about uh, the decision that we need here, to, we are here today to talk about, which is whether or not uh, council agrees to move forward with allowing us to utilize the portion of the RV park for the relocation site for the TOD. Um, just a reminder, if it is not uh, directed to, for us to proceed with this, we will continue to work on, uh, focus our uh, next efforts, our next steps on uh, the Opportunity Center and then come back to you at a later time. Uh, a reminder that this is not the last time you will hear or make a decision about the TOD or the, R the use of the RV park. We'll be back for two binding agreements, one for the, uh, the, R the property transaction uh, agreement, and so that's the binding agreement. We'll have all the details about the deal points, so the valuation, the uh, all the details about how the values of the properties that are being tra transitioned in this pro in this uh, this transaction, and then the second binding agreement will be the development agreement that's focused on the transit oriented development and the Opportunity Center at the current Century Link site. So that will get into all the details about ensuring that we. Um, we have in there the number of units that are required for affordable and all those all those items that were the components of that we've been talking about, that will be institutionalized, it'll be in a binding document that we'll be having discussions about and, um, and adopting, hopefully. Um, in addition, the uh, Opportunity Center lease is one that we'll, we'll uh, come back to council with negotiations and have a final figure for the city's financial obligation towards that. Again, we're looking at um, working with them on their what their contributions would be towards tenant improvements and what ours will be. Um, the comprehensive plan amendment uh, that is required for utilizing part of the RV park for something besides community facilities, that's currently on the docket, and so that's if we proceed with this, it will continue down that path, and you'll, it'll be back through the council process, and in November, uh, as a full docket, you'll, be, you'll look at that as well. So basically, we need to change that from community facilities to commercial to allow this, this development to proceed. And then um, we will come back to talk about the future RV park, including uh, a new management agreement, because the current management agreement ends at the end of this year. So, um, and we have, have, again, have not had detailed conversations with the current management firm, but we have um, initially heard that uh, this mo a smaller site may not be work for his business model, but there has been some interest from the current operator on site uh, to manage the park if we proceed. Thank you. And a quick timeline, uh, pretty much, uh, and in the, your packet, I'm sorry, we had February 3rd as a council action, but basically back in the second quarter for the binding property agreement, and then next year for the DA and um, hopefully open TOD 2025. Thank and you, I'm Jen. gonna invite Andrea back up here to 
And any of our sure. members are able to answer questions. Councilmember Goodman, do you have a question? Um, is there any possibility of expanding the RV park onto the road site so that they're not displaced at all? It's just a move to the adjacent property? That would be something we would need to look into and further assess. Council President Hunt. Um, that was that was part of my question, actually. And the, the other part was, um, it, for the foreseeable future, if we were to utilize part of this for the CenturyLink site, part of the RV park um, for the CenturyLink site, for the foreseeable future, it would not then be used by the Public Works Department? Um, or would it, would it still be used by the Public Works Department? Because in the table where you showed the two options, it mm -hmm. doesn't have that remainder of the RV park being used as the public works under the utilize a portion for CenturyLink. I think that uh, <clears throat> as we look into the future and what our needs are to expand the operations and maintenance facilities for the city, we really need to assess what are the needs and how are, you, are we using the existing facility. As I think we've discussed in previous presentations, the uh, plan for where the RV park is currently that was purchased many years ago and the master site plan, um, the concept was drafted years ago in anticipation of the annexation of Klahani. And since that uh, did not come to pass, um, I think as we move ahead and reassess what are the uh, f facility needs that we have to address operations and maintenance as the city grows, that's still a question that I think we need to revisit given that the circumstances have changed since we last planned. And so um, I think we uh, at this point don't anticipate uh, using, we, we haven't uh, planned far ahead because we don't know really what those needs are going to be and what properties um, would be available at that time. I think we also said uh, last time that uh, we have other facility needs that are a little bit more pressing and urgent. And so that's why I think different parts of this presentation referred to a 10 year plus time horizon for um, going back and performing that reassessment of what our operations and maintenance facility needs are. So I guess that's a really long winded way of saying that um, it's not shown in our, in our in the materials tonight of how we would anticipate using the remainder of the parcel because we still don't know exactly what we would need. But I think at that time, we would do that assessment to determine how would we use the, uh, what we refer to as the King County Roads parcel, how would we use the remainder um, or what's remaining of the RV park um, site and um, the other city properties as well. Um, can you go back to the two long-term options? Table. Uh, the f future steps or the? Yeah, yeah, this one. Okay. Um, so my, my question is really about this, that under do not utilize RV park, it has elimination of RV, RV park spaces and potential relocation assistance. And then under utilize RV park for TOD, it has determined ability to maintain reduced RV park spaces and potential relocation assistance. Mm -hmm. So it has elimination of RV park spaces under one option. and. It doesn't mention that under the other one, and because it's the future steps, I'm trying to assess see. future steps yes. impact. You know? Okay, thank you. Yes, so um, I think <clears throat> that the reason why it stated elimination of RV, RV park spaces and potential relocation assistance under do not utilize RV park is because that is what was anticipated under the original plan for the site, um, but I think we would need to revisit that. Um, so I'm not sure if that's accurate for the steps we would follow. Okay, so it's un it's unknown at this time in both In both. Scenarios. That's correct. Yes, I'm sorry for the confusion. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Have you finished with all the presentation of the information? Yes. So this one is for action tonight. Um, would someone care to make a motion and a second to enable council deliberations? Mr. President, Hunt? 
I move to proceed to negotiate a property agreement with CenturyLink to use a portion of the city-owned property currently utilized as an RV park at 651st Avenue Northeast for a relocation site for CenturyLink as part of the Transit-Oriented Development and Opportunity Center, TODOC, project and to bring back the negotiated agreement to the City Council for final review and approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion. Member Martz. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so three years, two administrations, many votes, and potentially many votes in front of us, yet still, this is a complicated deal with a complicated pedigree. Um, but I, I think at the heart, it's it's about what's the vision that we have? And then can do we, are we trying to get to yes, or are we trying to get to no, based on what our, what our vision is? And, uh, do we uh, want to try to uh, bring more affordable housing uh, into the heart of the city? Do we wanna try to bring additional services into the heart of the city? Um, Spectrum's trying to get to yes. King County Housing Authority's trying to get to yes. City of Issaquah has said yes and said yes and said yes. Uh, CenturyLink needs to be at the table. Mm -hmm. um, it's well and good that they may reach out to us. That's not, respe respectfully, that's not good enough. Um, after tonight's vote, if we vote in favor, they, we need to know that they wanna get to yes. Um, this, is, this has taken a lot of time. They're a big company, they have a lot going on. I know they have a commitment to the region. I need to see that commitment to this project. Um, 175 units at 40 to 80 percent of AMI would be tremendous. We've talked about a p potential five-year payback on our on our cash uh, contribution. Um, they spent 10 years trying to find uh, an opportunity center, or equivalent of an opportunity center location, and were unable. So that's an important part of this deal for me. Uh, it is unfortunate that we would lose some spaces that are currently um, being used for housing. I love the idea of seeing if, if there's a adjacent property that could be used. The loss of eight to 10-ish housing units would be unfortunate, but if the benefit is getting 175 units of long-term, high-quality housing co-located with market rate housing, that would be a tremendous win to me. So I'm gonna vote yes tonight and uh, I, I really, though, I, I want to see I want to see CenturyLink uh, trying to get to yes, and that would uh, after tonight. That's the that's the next big challenge. Thank you, Councilmember Mertz. Any other council members? Councilmember De Michelle, and did I see your hand go up, Council mm -hmm. President Hunt? Well, I will first of all I, I totally agree with Councilmember Mertz's uh, comments regarding Century Twenty One and I'm sorry that they couldn't be here tonight. Um, we've been given a lot of information tonight, but I do thank you for preparing a much more comprehensive presentation and, and uh, that helps us see the, this is a really big and complex picture. Um, so I'm, and I'm not gonna repeat or go through all of the things that you talked about. I just have a couple of points. Um, I think that if we go to the, baseline here you know what's the bottom line here this affordable housing is in our comprehensive plan it's in our affordable housing strategy it's in our central issaquah plan it's in the city strategic plan it's in our issaquah municipal code and yet right now in the um, central planning area we have zero housing and so uh, we had a discussion at our last work study session about the urgency for us to get going on climate change and, and do that. I feel the same urgency about this process. Uh, we, we've planned and we've planned and we've planned and we've planned and now we need to actually implement. Um, so, um, and the other uh, part of the project, that refers to the uh, TOD part of it, but uh, I also have a great interest in the Opportunity Center part of it. And um, again, have been very well aware for a long time about the need for uh, a healthcare provider, uh, HealthPoint, and for 
additional counseling services, both of those really big needs in our community. In their RFP, Health Point said that they had could identify 5,400 low-income people in our community who are uh, underserved or not served at all who would be able to take advantage of the Health Point facility. Um, that's part of their business plan, but it also gives us some information about what the need is in our community. Uh, right now, the only place that low-income people can go to get um, coverage is uh, Redmond, Renton, Bellevue, or Kent, and all of those include long trips to people who are probably stressed out already about transportation and um, may not have the means to get there or may not be able to take time off work to, to do that, to take a, a child that far. So having a um, opportunity center with Health Point in Valley Cities here would be a great service to our community. I'd also like to point out it'd be a great service <coughs> to our senior citizens as well. So I will support uh, this uh, proposal to begin the negotiations. And again, I agree, we're, this is not the last step. We've got a long way to go, but I think we need to step up and uh, we have said over and over again that we want to start the process of putting affordable housing in Issaquah. And uh, this would be a really important signal that we mean what we say. Thank you, Council Member. Council President Hunt, I neglected to go to you first, you being the motion maker, so I apologize for that. But uh, your comments. Um, thank you. I think that the plans, um, the need for the public works expansion, as has been presented to us before, those needs have changed over time. The original expansion plan for public works was um, before we knew whether Klahani would be annexed or not. And so I think those plans have changed and, um, or that, that context has changed around those plans and what really hasn't changed and what I think is not gonna change is the need for affordable housing in our community. And I see that as a growing concern and um, a growing need that the city needs to start doing things differently to start addressing. Um, I think the TOD project continues to be a good step for us to take to demonstrate that we are thinking about the need for affordable housing differently and that we're gonna do things differently to get the affordable housing that we want. Um, I also uh, think that it's a good step for us to have this be a transit-oriented development so that we can have the benefits not only of affordable, but also that it's transit-oriented, which makes it transit accessible and therefore that much more affordable for the folks living there. So I continue to be very supportive of the TOD project. Um, it's, it's now much more complicated in my opinion because of the RV park component, which is a new complexity in an already very complex project. And um, I wanted to sincerely thank the RV, the members of our community that came forward to provide the other side of the story. It's always good for us to know the other side of the story. And um, I think that one thing that had been mentioned previously in some of our, our materials was that this form of housing, the RV park, had not been in our housing strategy. And so as a person who had worked on our <clears throat> housing strategy in the Planning Policy Commission, um, our plans are fallible. They also change, they need to be updated. And so I think we should seriously consider how RV, um, how the RV park and how RV parks fit into our strategy. Um, it was also mentioned in the it's also mentioned in the previous pack, uh, previous materials that we had um, that uh, the management company <clears throat> receives either a fixed fee per month or 5% of mo monthly gross, gross income. And so I think that, um, you know, for a lot of folks, this is an affordable option for them and we should consider that and we should also make sure that we can minimize the impact and minimize the um, negative effects of our actions as we proceed to get 175 affordable units. Um, we should still make sure that we're being very um, cognizant of the impacts that 
will be taking place on the, at the RV park. And I am interested in exploring whether we could use part of the Casey <coughs> Road site. I'm also interested in um, whether council would consider long-term plan to support the RV site um, to make sure that we continue to have the RV park as an affordable, as an option of affordable housing um, for folks that choose that as well. Um, so I do remain supportive of, of the TOD. I will be voting in support of it, but this issue has gotten that much more complex for me and it's a very complex issue to begin with. And um, I think we should, we do have more decisions in front of us, but I think that um, in my opinion, we should proceed and then continue to work through these issues as we go on. Thank you, Council President Hunt. Dep Deputy Council President Ray. It was really fascinating. One of the first votes I took when I was on council was around approving the uh, transit-oriented development, and there was um, certainly for the transit-oriented development there was universal um, consensus that this is something we needed to do. Clearly, the the inability to use the King County Road site um, became quite a blocker. And, and then, you know, hats off to Jen and Andrea and at all for coming up with a solution and getting creative and figuring out how to move this thing forward. So that's that was no small feat, so thank you for doing that. Um, we do have some short-term um, complications that are associated with relocating the RV park and long-term complications associated with the need for public works operations facilities. And I have the same confidence in this team to solve that problem that they applied to solving the location for CenturyLink. So I know that we will be able to get to a solution that's gonna work for everybody in the long term. Um, that being said, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we have a solution that meets CenturyLink's needs and that we can move forward with this project. And um, you know, it's the culmination of a, an awful lot of effort and a lot of work by a lot of people um, and the perseverance is Amazing. Thank you, Deputy Council President. Any other comments? Uh, Council Member Goodman. Thank you. Um, so I too have, um, make no mistake, um, have been very supportive of the TOD project all along. Um, and because of the great affordable housing um, that it will provide um, for our community that's badly needed. And so I commend all of the partners and the contributors for the long, long, long hard work and the patience that um, for this project. Um, as we heard tonight, and we've heard before in the past couple of meetings that uh, things changed for the public works operations expansion primarily because um, Klahani was not annexed. Um, so then of course things also changed for the RV park, which means there was no longer the need to, to um, uh, think of that RP, our, our RV park as, I mean, we always thought of it as, not always, but had thought of it because of the expansion project, we had thought of it as being temporary, and we've heard that word temporary. Um, I don't think about it as temporary any longer because our plans changed for the public works operations expansion. So I am um, very troubled by the thought of displacing the RV park residents, and I too, um, thank you for coming to the meeting and sharing your um, perspective. And that's very important to me. Um, there is a need for RV parks for the reasons that we heard tonight, and some of those reasons were very enlightening to me because I didn't know those. So again, I thank you for coming to our meeting. Um, what I haven't been supportive of is the arrangement, um, the lease and financial arrangement for the just one particular part of the TOD project, and that's the Opportunity Center. Um, we have looked for space for a human services campus off and on um, over a period of about 10 years. This is not a human services campus. Um, I personally don't think that the city should own this space. I think the city should not be in the landlord business, certainly to not, not at this level. And I also don't think the city should be um, a lender um, to the degree that this project would require us to be a lender. However, I will support uh, moving forward to negotiate, um, the next step being negotiation, but I will be looking very carefully at the terms of that negotiation, and I'm also, um, as was mentioned by um, 
Deputy Council President Ray. That's such Why a long time. Why are we all struggling with that tonight? <laughs> Too many syllables. Okay. Um, DCP. DCP Ray. Um, I'll be very interested in the nego negotiations and also, as mentioned, um, interested in working out some way that we're not displacing people. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm assuming Council Member Hall has some <coughs> comments for us. <coughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank um, Hal and Dan and Jen and Andrea for um, jumping on the phone with uh, us council newbies uh, to walk us through the entire history and timeline of uh, this project. I found it incredibly helpful um, in um, just framing the project in my head. So thank you very much. Um, I'll also be supporting this agenda bill. I'm not willing to see this opportunity pass us by, and I've heard loud and clear now uh, several times that it's really now or never with uh, transit-oriented development um, for this particular project. Um, and um, I do think that it's frustrating. You know, we've heard several concerns about displacement, um, environmental uh, concerns that we heard at um, our last study session, which was our last touch with this, um, but. I just think that there are so many families and individuals here in Issaquah that would benefit from access to affordable units, uh, especially transit-oriented uh, and transit-accessible uh, affordable units in the Opportunity Center. Um, and I think that it meets so many of the other service needs that was identified in the community needs assessment, um, access to healthcare, other behavioral health services that uh, gets me to yes. Um, I'm encouraged to hear that administration and staff uh, are, already have plans for relocation assistance and, and helping folks out there. Um, I'd like more information about this process and, and your vision for this process as soon as possible, if uh, that's appropriate and if that's something you think you could do. Um, it's, um, I'll just say it's of utmost importance to me. Um, I'd also like to know more about how we can use remaining property, the remaining property, the King County Roads property, um, for other uses, whether it be the RV park um, expansion, if necessary, for public works. This has all been said before. Um, a couple more things to echo, and I've been told to never say the word echo <laughs> up here before, but I'm just gonna do it, so. Um, I'll also, I'd also like us to start uh, an ongoing conversation, I'm just echoing uh, Council President Hunt right now, um, about how RV Park Living can support our affordable housing goals. So I'll just chime in there as well. And then I, I wanted to end by saying I absolutely loved Deputy Council President Ray's earlier comments. I'm not having a hard time saying that. Yeah, it's, you're the it's only fine. One yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, comments about um, uh, confidence in city staff. I have the uh, most confidence that you guys will be able to find um, the best path forward um, with all these challenging issues that we're facing now. And um, yeah, I'll end it there. Great, thank you. If there are no other comments, I will read the motion again before the vote. All those in favor of proceeding to negotiate a property agreement with CenturyLink to use a portion of the city-owned property currently utilized as an RV park at 650 First Avenue Northeast for a relocation site for CenturyLink as part of the transit-oriented development and Opportunity Center project and to bring back the negotiated agreement to the City Council for a final review and approval, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you, that carries unanimously. We have a couple more items on the agenda this evening. The next one is good of the order. Does any council member have anything for good of the order? And if not, I will go over uh, some upcom upcoming council meetings. On February 25th, there will be a council study session at 6.30 p.m. and the potential agenda items include Old Town Land Use Code <coughs> Amendments, Old Town Sub-Area Design Standards and Architectural Guidelines, Old Town Traffic Calming, there is a theme here. Title 18 Land Use Code Update, this is the Ad Hoc Planning Committee report out. And at the March 2nd regular City Council meeting at 7 p.m., the potential agenda items are park impact fees and the K4C joint, um, the King County Cities Climate Collaboration Commitments Update. Um, so those are the meetings that are coming up. And the last thing we have on our agenda this evening is an executive session. 
As earlier announced, there will be an executive session this evening to discuss pending and potential litigation per RCW 42.30.110 per N1 per NI. And I'm just going to um, maybe not go for the full 50 minutes right now and say that we'll start with 30 minutes. No action is anticipated to follow an open session. We will extend if necessary. Uh, so we're recessing into executive session at 1032.